tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. A very good afternoon to you and a very happy Friday. It's 3 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dordmey Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Well, she danced onto stage when she was Prime Minister, but like dozens of other MPs, Theresa May will exit stage right at the next election. Just why are so many Conservatives quitting? Hmm, I wonder. Education Secretary Gillian Keegan is in hot water yet again. Um, she said she would probably punched a teaching inspector, an offset inspector, who was apparently was really rude to her. But it's not the smartest thing to say, is it? And the government's counter-extremism saw has said that London streets have become a no-go zone for Jewish people during pro-Palestinian -pro protests. What on earth has happened to our country? So welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure to have your company. Now, I've been asking all morning, is Theresa May the worst Prime Minister the Conservative Party have ever had? I've had hundreds, in fact, well over a 1,000 responses. Let me know what you think. Keep them clean. GBviews at gbnews.com. Nigel Farage always said that he felt Theresa May was the worst, but has she been surpassed since? by people who followed her. Let me know your thoughts and I'll read out the best. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. Your top story. Northern Ireland's First Minister has apologised to the families of alleged informers who were killed by the IRA and says she's wholeheartedly committed to healing wounds of the past. 
Her comments come after a major investigation found more lives were probably lost than saved by a double agent during the Troubles. Codenamed Steak Knife, he was working covertly with the British Army inside the IRA's internal security unit. Operation Canova examined more than 100 murders and abductions linked to the unit. The investigation was conducted by Bedfordshire Police over a seven-year period, costing around £40 million. Now, a PSNI Chief Constable, John Butcher, says there was strong evidence of a very serious criminality. Steak Knife was undoubtedly a valuable asset who provided intelligence about the RA at considerable risk to himself, claims that he was responsible for saving countless or hundreds of lives are hugely exaggerated. Most importantly, these claims belie the fact that Steak Knife was himself involved in very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality whilst operating as an agent, including murders. Steak Knife is widely believed to have been a West Belfast man who was 77 when he died last year. Solicitor Kevin Winters, who represents a number of the victims' families, says he needs to be identified officially. The decision not to name Fred Capitacia as the agent steak knife has been difficult for many to accept. The legal and technical rationale for doing so will be lost on many people, particularly next of kin of those murdered. Met Police Firearms Officer Martin Blake has denied the murder of Chris Cabber after being named publicly for the first time. The 24-year-old was shot once in the head through the windscreen of a car in South London in September 2022. The officer was initially identified as NX121, but it was ruled the 40-year-old can now be named because it poses no real risk to his life or that of his family. He's been released on bail and is due to face trial in October. Now, the counter-extremism SAR has warned London has become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestinian protests. It's after the Prime Minister said forces are trying to tear the country apart. Writing in The Telegraph, Robin Simcock said Rishi Sunak was right to raise concerns about the increase in extremist disruption. He says policies are needed to meet the scale of the challenge faced. And he urged ministers to be bolder and willing to accept higher legal risk when tackling extremism. In other news, the Foreign Secretary says it's incredibly frustrating that Israel's not taking steps to allow more aid into Gaza. His comments come after the UK announced it will join the US to create a new port on the Strip by providing planning support and sending marine surveyors. However, the Foreign Secretary says there's an option to deliver aid to Gaza immediately while the temporary pier is being constructed. This new idea from the President of the United States, which we're involved in, of building a temporary harbour in Gaza, means that aid will be able to go directly from Cyprus to Gaza. But it's going to take time to build. So the crucial thing is, today, the Israelis must confirm that they'll open the port at Ashdod. That is in Israel, but that's a working port. It could take aid now, that would increase the amount of aid, and that aid can then be driven into Gaza. That would make a real difference, and we need to make a real difference right now. Now, the Education Secretary has said she would probably have punched rude Ofsted staff after hearing about a school inspection. It comes after the watchdog, which has launched a major consultation into its future direction, has come under greater scrutiny in the past year following the suicide of head teacher Ruth Perry. Addressing hundreds of school and college leaders, Gillian Keegan said the culture of inspection was the biggest thing that needed to change following her death. I've heard from my own, you know, my own constituency, people say, I heard, I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into. Um, and, and they said, they told me how the officer, you know, their officer experience had gone. And I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. Former Prime Minister Theresa May will stand down at the next general election, bringing her 27-year career as an MP to an end. Announcing her decision, the member for Maidenhead said she wants to focus on causes such as the fight against modern slavery. She's been the Conservative MP for the Berkshire seat since 1997. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
Thank you, Sophia. Now, we start with the big news that the MP for Maidenhead will not stand at the next general election. Her name is Theresa May. Now, I don't know if you heard of her or not, but she's <laughs> quitting politics just when the Tories seem to be heading for the electoral meltdown. Well, Mrs May picked up the ultimate poison chalice in 2016 when she became Prime Minister after the Brexit referendum. Look at that walk. What a natural. And sure enough, after more than two tortuous years on the job and having spectacularly failed to get Brexit done, she then resigned. And here's what the good people of Maidenhead, her constituency, think of her decision. Good MP for Maidenhead, as far as I can tell. Um, my reaction is that uh, I'm sorry to see her go. She's been a brilliant uh, MP. Uh, I admire her a lot, and it's, it's a shame that she's standing down. Uh, I think she's been a, a good constituency you know, uh, MP, but... Uh, um, as a Prime Minister, I think she was uh, lacking somewhat, to say the least. But I think it's a shame she didn't have the chance to show what she'd be like as a Prime Minister. And I think the problem is she was scuppered by the right wing of her party. Well, I never voted for Conservatives, but Theresa May was better than well, just Boris Johnson, God. Since, since I've been down here, of course she did a lot for us around here. Well, she still did, it does. You know, she never really had a chance to uh, show, and I think her Brexit would have probably been a preferable one to the one we ended up with. So there we go, that's what the good people of Maidenhead think, but what about our political editor, Chris Hope, who joins me in the studio? Chris, clearly very, very well liked in her constituency, a very competent member of parliament, but was she over-promoted to become prime minister? Sure, well, she picked up the, the chaos of David Cameron, <clears throat> who we heard earlier on the news, uh, just leaving on the day he lost the EU referendum. His mistake, of course, was to get involved in, in, the, in, the, in the debate in the first place. He should have allowed the debate to happen, and I will then deliver the, the will of the people. He didn't, he got involved, but that's why he was not around for a few years. Theresa May came in. I mean, for me, she was, she never, she was always a Remainer, but she was a nuanced rem Remainer. I was there when she set out her, the stall on being a Brexiteer or not, and she gave us a long argument. What's a nuanced Remainer? Well, she kind of wasn't... She kind of just about was Remain, but not Brexit. But I think she didn't see Brexit as an opportunity, but not... A, but a problem to be solved. Mm. And as soon as you go into a conversation in that way, a negotiation, if you like, there's no way you're going to get a good answer for Britain. And, the, you know, as it was, if Jeremy Corbyn had gone in and accepted the idea of, of doing some kind of national government or some agreement mm. on Brexit, it would have split the Tory party for mm. a generation and it would have been probably not a great thing for the UK. So I think on Brexit... Yeah, no question on Twitter, my social media, full of people giving a hard time. Locally, a really good MP. Now, you heard there from those people. I do know that when she would go back from those torturous meetings in Brussels, when she was humiliated trying to get the Brexit deal that was never got over the line, over the line, she would go back on the Friday night. On Saturday morning, she'd be out there, you know, in a bib, work, helping a fun run happen. She'd be serving food to old people. She absolutely is a local MP mm. first and Prime Minister second. And that's why she announced she was going through the Maidenhead Advertiser. And that's what, that's what people think about her. She's absolutely got public service. But on Brexit, she got it badly wrong. You certainly did now. Stick around, Chris. But I'm now joined by Deanna Davison, who's the Conservative MP for Bishop Auckland. Welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on, Deanna. You there? I'm Hello. here. Hi, Martin. Thanks for joining us. So, um, Theresa May, the, the second best female Prime Minister the Tories ever had. What's your take on her? I think Theresa May is a, a real kind of testament to the importance of public service and what it means. I mean, you know, quietly serving away as an MP for, for the most part of, of the 27 years that she's been the MP for Maidenhead, plus a role on her local council before that too. Um, gain the respect of people kind of right across the board for the diligent way in which she kind of approaches issues. Um, I, I think she, a really impressive character and one that really will be missed in Parliament, because I think it's been quite telling that even having stood down as Prime Minister some years ago, she still remained in Parliament, fighting for her constituency and focusing on causes that really matter to her, like her agenda on uh, modern slavery, um, which we know a lot of women really do relate to right across the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, Hannah, it's Chris Hope in the studio. Hi. Just a quick one. Do you think Hi, that your party got the leaders in the wrong way round? If you got Boris Johnson in straight after Brexit, he'd have got a proper deal and left, and then Theresa May would have taken over during the COVID pandemic, it might have been better. 
do you know, I, I've kind of panned out this alternative history with a few friends a few times. And I think that may well be the case, you know, that exuberance and kind of pro Brexit spirit of, of Boris and that real kind of gung-ho attitude may have served as well in those early days of that Brexit negotiation. I think we'd hoped that Theresa May's quite diligent approach would be um, a benefit. But of course, there were two facts at play. One, the fact that she didn't back Brexit during that referendum, which I think regrettably harmed her credentials with some of the more or Brexiteer ends of the Conservative Party. Um, uh, and two, the fact that she went for that general election hoping to get a stonking majority. And of course, it didn't really come to fruition, which meant really she had sort of at least one arm tied behind her back for the negotiations that followed. But actually, I think having Theresa May at the helm through the COVID pandemic would have been a really positive thing. I certainly don't think anyone would have got away with the Downing Street Party with her in charge. <laughs> Diana, um, she's stepping aside before the election. I think it makes it now 63 Conservative MPs who are currently sitting or voluntarily standing aside. And, of course, you are also one of them. What do you think it is about the current environment that is making so many Conservatives rub their chin and think this just isn't worth standing for anymore? I think everyone's story is a little bit different, so I don't necessarily want to speculate on everyone. I mean, for me, it's the fact that Frankly, I got into politics so young. I've been somewhat in front line since I was about 21. I was looking ahead to 30 and thought, is life I want? Do I want to be in the public eye? Do I want to face the abuse, the threats, the intimidation day in, day out and put my family through that? And for me, the answer was no, no that was my decision. I know there are other um, MPs who've decided to stand down off the back of threats and personal intimidation, which frankly only seems to be getting worse in this kind of really polarised social media age that we live in. Um, I think for some people, of course, they probably are looking ahead, thinking, am I going to win my seat? Is it worth stepping away now and trying to find something else to do? That probably is a factor for some people. Mm. And, Diana, yeah, I, rem I remember you were, you were very open about um, sort of the experiences in your life, and, and I thought you were wonderful with that, and you got a hell of a lot of mm. stick, and it was terrible what you went through. I remember at the time I reached out to you, and I, I'm, I'm still sorry for what you had to go through about what you said about your father and what happened, and I think it was shocking. And I'm not surprised if things like that kind of um, add to the gravity of your decision. So I hope you sort of, you know, do better in the future. But before all of that, I want to ask you about Gillian Keegan. She's put a foot in it again. You may have seen the comments. I'll just read them out. She was at a conference. Um, I some might say it was a throwaway comment. They were talking about an Ofsted inspection um, that went wrong. She said, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I would met these people, I would probably have punched them. They were really rude. Now, we all know a throwaway comment um, can happen. But, of course, the Daily Mirror are making hay out of this. She is actually the education minister. It was at a school event. We know that there is a problem with Ofsted. One is Ofsted inspectors committed suicide. We also know there's a problem with violence in schools. Is this a, a mountain out of a mole, or is it a serious issue? It's, it's regressible language, I think. You know, I, I'm someone who campaigns <laughs> amusingly on this particular issue. I run mm. a, uh, an anti-violence campaign based around one-punch assault. So hearing that language coming out, I think, from any frontline politician is a little bit disappointing, to be honest. I think there are legitimate concerns around Ofsted, and obviously as Education Secretary, she's probably right to address those. I don't like policing language too much. We've got to be cautious, but certainly that's not language that I would have used. OK, well, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Deanna Davison, Conservative MP for Bishop Auckland, and the very best of luck for the future. Thanks for joining us today. Now, at four o'clock, I'll be joined by a man who has known Theresa May for more than 15 years and give us the inside track on the former Prime Minister. And there's plenty of coverage of that on this story on our website, gbnews.com. You've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country, so thank you very much. Now it's time now for the latest Great British Giveaway and your chance to win £12,345 in cash and a whole host of seasonal treats. And here's how you could get your hands on all of that stuff. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 
£145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Great to have loads more on that Gideon Keegan story later in the show. But Chris Hope, you're still with us. What's your take on that event? Is it an unfortunate moment? Well, I've been talking to friends of Gillian Keegan and they do tell me that this was a kind of uh, off-the-cuff uh, Liverpudlian. It wasn't a threat of violence. She was just trying to make a point at an event hosted by the Association of School and College Leaders. So with other people who have to deal with off Ofsted, she's trying to make a, a light-hearted comment uh, that was taken as a such by the room. So it was a throwaway line. Taking that out of context is, is dramatic but they're trying to make clear it was meant to be an off-the-cuff off remark. OK, thank you very much. Now, this is a staggering story. An investigation has found that more lives were probably lost than saved through the British Army's operation of its top agents inside the IRA's internal security unit during the Troubles. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, I of course, you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use if you commit, There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, you, earn, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no solution. no it's easy if you it's see, that's easy an impossible solution they've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all indeed but it's a good thing for all do not abuse it that simple I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Sundays from 6pm, The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show, Sundays from 6pm on GB News.
Welcome back. 3.21 is the time. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, discuss the claim from the government's counter-extremism saw that London streets have become a no-go zone for Jews during the pro-Palestine protests. Well, we've been saying that for weeks. Now, to a story that I can tell you has got many firearms officers in this country absolutely fuming. The Metropolitan Police marksman who shot dead Chris Caber has been publicly named for the first time. Martin Blake denied murder when he appeared at the Old Bailey today. And for an update on this story, I'm joined by our home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, welcome to the show. What's the latest? Well, that name of Martin Blake was made public finally after a media uh, challenge in the courts. He had been granted anonymity when he was first charged in September of last year and had been known simply as NX121. Uh, that was cha challenged by the media really under open justice uh, rules, given that the vast majority of people who are charged with the criminal offence are normally named. Uh, the judge, Mark Lucraft at the Old Bailey today, agreed with the media, lifted that anonymity order and allowed us to name Martin Blake. Now, there are certain restrictions. We cannot show images of this 40-year-old officer. We can't tell you uh, his home address either. He was in the dock at the Old Bailey to deny the charges, a charge of murdering Chris Caba in September of 2022, uh, Mr. Kaba was in an Audi, not his vehicle, uh, driving through Streatham in South London uh, when firearms officers attempted to stop that vehicle. It had been linked to a uh, firearms offence the previous day. Uh, during that operation to stop the vehicle, a shot was fired through the front windscreen that struck Chris Kaba in the head and he died in hospital the next again day. As I say, this officer, this 40-year-old officer, denies the charges. He'll face trial in October of this year. But the, the wider picture with regard to this naming convention today and indeed the decision to charge this officer with murder in the first place um, really brought the Metropolitan Police Force uh, into a state of crisis as far as its armed capability is concerned. When the decision was announced in September of last year to charge this officer, hundreds of firearms officers <coughs> from the Metropolitan Police stepped back from their armed duties. Uh, and we await what the reaction will be now that the uh, naming of this officer has taken place as well. The Metropolitan Police braced for the potential that many more of these firearms officers may feel that it's just not worth the risk for them anymore and they will have stepped back from what is uh, a volunteer role. OK, thank you for that update, Mark White. Now to a shocking report that has revealed that the use of informers by British intelligence during the Troubles cost more lives than it saved. I'm joined now by GB News' Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beatty. Doogie, an astonishing story, um, a £40 million report into Agent Steak Knife. Tell us more. Well, this, this Canova report was first headed up by John Boucher, who is now the Chief Constable of the PSNI in Northern Ireland. And it really did look at state involvement in and around terrorism, how they uh, used informers and how were they low-level or high-level informers. And low-level were called horse handlers. I mean, they knew that was going to happen and, and they were paid a, a few pounds, etc. But this one in particular was right at the very head of the IRA. He was up in amongst there. And back in the early 80s, the mid-80s, the IRA Belfast Brigade was that badly compromised that it was really South Tyrone brigades that were taking the lead in this. And of course then you had the Loch Gall Massacre where the SAS uh, ambushed eight IRA men there. And when you think about that, they, they didn't do that by accident. Somebody inside the Army Council had actually told British forces what was going to happen because it was so complete of a massacre. And then it really brings into question how many of these informers were in place. This was the killing of Catholics by Catholics, by nationalists, by the IRA, in their own communities. And we've really got to look, and I keep on saying about it, 1998, Good Friday Agreement, Letters of Comfort, 
and Queen's pardons of mercy were given to members of Sinn Féin and the IRA mm. so as they would never have to go to court. British soldiers keep getting brought back to court because they say they have kept uh, uh, the information in this. Well, they quite obviously have. And really, the government now needs to be very clear with these nationalist communities who got the letters of comfort, why did they get it? And because the information is quite obviously there, and this is more embarrassing for Sinn Féin than anybody. And the big question is, how much did the British Secret Service and Security Services know about what this individual was up to, Freddie Scapatici, linked to these 50 murders? Were they letting him go rogue? Were they letting him get away with this? Because if they intervened, it might have blown his cover. Well, that's exactly what they were doing. I mean, they, they, they were letting it happen because it suited them to do so at the time. And this isn't uh, uncommon practice. And when you're talking about countries like Syria or Iraq or whatever, British intelligence, American intelligence, do... Um, compromise some other agents, pay them off, whatever they do. And of course, this the problem with this is, this is UK special forces turning on UK population. This is British citizens mm -hmm. being taken out, if you like, with the assistance of the British um, intelligence service. And that's where this gets extremely serious. Mm -hmm. you, got, you got a clip of to show us. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, Gavin Larmer, his father was a RUC constable that was shot dead on the Lisburn Road in Belfast. And he very seriously believes that there was an informer involved. And he has told me that the PPS are very much trying to stop these cases coming forward and he wants them looked at. Yes, I'll look. And the bigger question is how corrupt is the PPS? The first four set of charges was for perjury, which was probably the easiest charge to prove. You've got the deposition statement or the witness statement in front of you. All you've got to show is at the time that was made, it was knowingly false or knowingly misleading or inaccurate. But who was being charged? Freddie Scapatici, two MI5 officers, and the woman who was previously Deputy Director of the PPS. How is that not a conflict of interest? Maybe it needs to go to the CPS in London for a judicial review as to just how independent the PPS decisions here were because they're quite happy to put forward Republican inquests and civil compensation claims. But when it comes to actually prosecuting a terrorist, no, that might rock the Good Friday Agreement. We can't have that. So, Doogie, Freddie Scapatici um, was alleged to have been involved in the Nutting Squad. Um, they were involved in kidnapping, torturing, killing victims. You met him. What yeah. was he like? I, in, in my job, then, I, I met many of these men on, on several occasions, and uh, I did meet him on three occasions. Uh, and, you know, like any of these people, they're actually very charming. They're uh, a bit of a laugh. Uh, but you, you're always, when you're in that situation, you're always thinking to yourself... I know the rumours behind this and where this is going. Because don't forget, these nutting squads, as they were, were also trying to keep up what they seen as morality in their community. And, and many of the people that they took out and beat uh, and, and tortured were actually innocents and had nothing to do with what was happening inside terrorism at that time. So he, he was quite a convincing character and really quite a charming man. Wow. A charming man linked to the murders of over 50. Doogie Beatty, absolutely fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing it with us here in the Westminster Studio GB News. Now, there's loads more still to come between now and 4 o'clock, and it's emerged that Britain will pay Libya a million pounds to stop migrants crossing the Mediterranean Channel. Actually, I think it's a great idea. Why didn't they think of that before? Stop this problem at its source. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, in fact, from the GB newsroom. It's just gone 3.30. We start with the top story of the day, that uh, a major independent investigation has been found uh, to be likely to have lost more lives uh, in that investigation rather than were saved by a double agent who was embedded in the IRA troubles. 
The individual, codenamed Steak Knife, was working covertly for the British Army inside the IRA's internal security unit. Operation Canova examined more than 100 murders and abductions linked to the unit and found strong evidence of very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality. Met Police Firearms Officer Martin Blake has denied the murder of Chris Cabber after being named publicly for the first time. The 24-year-old was shot once in the head through the windscreen of a car in South London in September 2022. The officer, who was initially identified as NX121, has been released on bail and is due to face trial in October. The counter-extremism SAR, who has warned London has become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestine protests. Writing in The Telegraph, Robin Simcox said policies are needed to meet the scale of the challenge that's faced as he urged ministers to be bolder and willing to accept higher legal risk when tackling extremism. And finally, Lord David Cameron says it's incredibly frustrating that Israel is not taking steps to allow more aid into Gaza. His comments come after the UK announced it will join the US and other allies to create a new port on the Strip. However, the Foreign Secretary says Ashdod port in Israel could be opened immediately so that aid can be delivered while the temporary pier is being constructed. Those are the latest headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2875 and €1.1656. Euros. The price of gold is £1,685.81, that's per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is currently at 7,658 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Sam. Now, ahead of a huge pro-Palestine protest in London tomorrow, an expert has warned that the demos are turning the capital into a no-go zone for Jews. Well, there are no-go zones for anybody who disagrees with them. In my opinion, I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Business News Channel. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9pm. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty.
Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 3.37 is your time and you're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, some very worrying words from the government's counter-extremism commissioner. Robin Simcox has said that the pro-Palestinian protests are making London a no-go zone for Jewish people. And this is the head of another, yet another, huge protest in the area tomorrow. And, the urge, and he urges the government to take bold action in tackling extremism. But the government faces mounting pressure to ensure London remains inclusive and safe for all communities. Well, of course it does, apart from the Jewish community. And to discuss that now, I'm joined in the studio in Westminster by Junior's presenter, Josh Howie. Josh, welcome to the studio, although we always seem to be together under these unfortunate circumstances. Mm. They've finally woken up. The Home Office have taken the position that these marchers are turning parts of London into no-go zones. We've been saying that on this channel for weeks. I know you've been saying that for a long time. Um, Lee Anderson said it. Swella Bradman said it. They got the boot. Now they're agreeing. But in terms of your experience as a Jewish person, mm. do you agree with this? Yeah, absolutely. And it's incredible it's taken so long for people to catch up with it. But, uh, I mean, the language, the people on the protest, they call it peace marches, right? Mm -hmm. And we would classify it as a hate march. Well, for the people who are calling it a peace march, who see these placards with not just kind of like anti-Israel sentiment, like outright anti-Semitism, like calling, saying Jews run the world, um, or people like calling for jihad, like, you know, people having flags of actual terrorist organisations that the police then pretend aren't. Um, this stuff is hateful stuff. And the thing that I would say to those people is, well, where, who of you is actually asking for peace? Because you don't see people crying for peace. No, they're going from the river to the sea. They're calling for the genocide of Jews. They're calling for intifada, which yeah. for Israelis is blown up buses and cafes. So where are the actual cries for peace, number one? And number two is the people who sort of go on and say, well, let's get rid of Hamas or Hamas is a terrorist organisation. Someone went up uh, two weeks ago. That person had a thing saying Hamas are terrorists. That person was chased mm. by the peace activists and the mm. police had to protect for that own person and take that person away. It is fair to say, Josh, um, you get bad eggs on every type of protest. The vast majority of people on those protests would say they are sticking up for what they believe to be 30,000 people who've been killed in this conflict, and they're not all crying for jihad. So it's, it's important to point out, not everybody... Yeah, but, but you know what? The same people who are sort of the far-left cranks who are on those marches would also say, oh, they would condemn anybody who... You know, what's that saying? If there's nine people having a dinner party and one of them's a Nazi, then it's a Nazi dinner party. That's, that's like that phrasing from them. So who of them are actually calling out these placards? Who are, the, who are them are actually calling out this, uh, these hateful genocidal cries? And none of them, you know, from, it's the hypocrisy. I'm from the left, but the hypocrisy of people who would go, you know, before when things... Language changes. That's normal, right? And people go, oh, there's a certain word now that uh, some people are uncomfortable with. Oh, OK, I didn't realise that was an uncomfortable word. I'll change my language. That's fine. But in this case, they're like, no, this is what we're going to chant. We're going to chant from the river to the sea, even though it comes from an Arabic saying that it's literally the genocide of Jews. They, they don't care about that. And worse than that now is we're actually seeing another development, which I've seen this week, where people are actually on the left going, wait, OK, it is racist, but, hey, what's happening in Gaza? What happened to, you know, microaggressions and these things that racism has to dealt, be dealt with? It's like, no, suddenly because what's happening in Gaza, racism in London is bad. That's mm -hmm. what they're saying. 
I've spoken to people who've organised these marches and they say, well, why are Jewish people upset? We, the, the marches take place on a Saturday. Jewish people aren't about. You're busy obeying your faith. What do you say to that? Well, I say, first of all, what racism is OK even if, the, if there's no one there of that particular ethnicity. That's a ridiculous statement. Mm. And the second thing I say is, my synagogue is in town. I go in with my son, uh, who is having... He's, he's learning for his bar mitzvah, so I have to take him in every week. And it's very uncomfortable. Now, a few weeks ago, there was footage, out, literally outside of our synagogue, of about four police vans, about 20 police, barricading our synagogue, protecting them from the march. Who are they protecting them from? They're protecting them from, what, elements of the marches. And... I'm glad that I didn't have to take my son on that day because I don't want to have to explain to him. Already he has security at school. He ha we do have security at the synagogue. But to that level, go, mate, this is how much some people hate us, mm. that we need 20 people, 20 police people protecting us so we can go in in safety to our mm. synagogue, to our place of prayer. And being on the tube and being surrounded by... I've been on the tube in these instances when people are gathering for these marches. It's a very uncomfortable mm. position. You are afraid if someone's going to see your Star of David. Why should I have to put my Star of David away? Why should I not be able to wear my yarmulke if it's a Saturday? Why, uh, why are there relig more religious Jews who are feeling like they, they're unable to go into town? It's, it, it, it's, the point is, for, it's, not, it's not OK for anybody, mm. let alone Jewish people. So Rob Simcox, the Home Office's independent advisor on extremism, is, is saying, don't let hi extremists hijack your marchers to the march organisers mm. and he's saying this is not OK. Do you have any faith in that? No, I don't, because they've been emboldened. They've been emboldened now from weeks. I read it online. Someone said on the day after October 7th, when, when the blood was still drying, people were out, Islamists were out on our streets, marching, setting off flares. They, flares, they should have been immediately shut down. And they weren't. And ever since then, it's got greater and greater. And they have felt, like I said, more emboldened. Uh, and where are the people on the left? Where are the people in those marches? I haven't seen one person in those marches confronting an anti-Semitic placard, confronting someone chanting for the death of Jews. That never happens. It's, and again, it's hypocrisy. Well, I did. Mm. I went to, I'm not a Jewish person, but I mm. went to Parliament Square and I, I pointed that from the river to the sea, Big Ben projector mm. out to the police and said, there it is, what are you going to do? They weren't interested in doing anything about it. There was a guy with a placard that was offensive. They didn't do anything about that. Mm. There were guys in a full ski mask, balaclavas. I said, go and arrest them, you've got power to do it. They didn't want to know, Josh. So there are people out there challenging well, so, them. But I'm saying people of the of part of their community, yeah, right. of part, of part of that far yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, I'm not saying that you're... <laughs> but I'm just saying that they're not policing themselves. Yes. And then, and then, OK, fine. Well, then the police are meant to police them. And as you say, I remember... See, do you remember, like, so when you said the, 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 on the uh, on Parliament with yeah. the projection, and then the police were like, well, no, it should have... It's all about context and whatnot. It's illegal to do that in the... Whatever the message was, it's illegal. You have a right to arrest these people. And the police haven't been doing that. Now, I understand there are reasons. I'm not saying that they're anti-Semitic, but they have to... Um, there aren't the numbers, necessarily. Yeah. There aren't the resources there. And anybody steps out... Like, you've seen this footage of people pushing the police back, pushing yeah. people with their masks. Someone who pushes the police just... You should be arrested. And yeah. they're not doing that. And they probably would do if they were football fans or from the other side. Josh Harry, thank you very much for joining us in the studio and giving us your impassioned view. Excellent stuff. Now, still to come, I'll talk about the new deal that really could make a real difference to our migrant crisis. And it's costing us just one million quid. I reckon that's a price worth paying for it, if it works. But first, in a GB News new series, Innovation Britain, we're looking at the successes of the magnificent British manufacturing industry around the country. We're here at Boya Engineering in Andover in the southwest of England. They take on lots of apprentices every single year. Sharon, why are apprenticeships important to Boya? They're important to Boya, but they're important to all small manufacturing businesses everywhere, really. We've got a lack of real skills coming in to the manufacturing, manufacturing business, and this allows us to get the apprentices in from the colleges, we can train them up, we work really closely with them, and we can keep the skills that we teach them. And you're lucky enough to manage the apprentices here at Bowyer, Sharon. Yep. What does that apprenticeship scheme actually look like? 
Okay, it's a generally a three or four year course. We take the apprentices from the local colleges. We work really closely with them. Their assessors come out in three or four month periods. They assess them, we work really closely. We get them up, they get them up to the standard that they should be to complete their apprenticeship, apprenticeships. Um, and we teach them all we can here, essential skills for the small businesses that we need. And then hopefully they stay with us and carry on and we've made brilliant machinists, machinists yep. out of them. The local colleges are heavily funded by the government levy. Um, so they get a lot of money in. So I think because of that, the colleges are putting in more effort um, into getting apprentices, apprenticeships out there to the local businesses because they're funded. So we are only reaping the benefits for that. But it's changing attitudes to apprenticeships here in Andover. Hello, good morning. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. It will be a dry afternoon for many areas with some sunshine, but there's a relatively brisk easterly breeze for many areas. That's as this area of high pressure across Scandinavia still brings in that easterly wind. Further south, though, we'll start to see low pressure arriving, bringing some weather fronts and some rain for the weekend. But that easterly breeze across northeastern areas will continue to drag in cloud and some drizzly rain through the next few hours. Further south, though, parts of the southeast, it'll be a much sunnier and brighter afternoon compared to yesterday so it will feel a little bit warmer in the sunshine but that easterly wind will bring a chilly feel for many areas. Through tonight, the cloud will thicken from the south and west as this band of showery rain pushes up to cover many southern coasts by tomorrow morning. Further north, though, it should stay dry, but it will be quite a cloudy and windy night. So that does mean it will be frost-free by the start of the weekend, but it's still going to be a fairly chilly start. The winds will be a bit stronger through, through Saturday compared to today, particularly across northwestern areas as the winds are squeezed over the high ground. So quite a gusty afternoon, but it will will be dry and bright for many western areas of Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland and northwestern England. But further south, cloud will thicken through the day and there'll be some showery outbreaks of rain. These could turn quite heavy across the southwest in the afternoon, but it will still feel fairly pleasant in any brighter breaks. See you later on. Bye bye. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. This Sunday on Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle, I'll be delving into the WPATH files, explosive revelations leaked by whistleblowers that show how the world's top transgender medical experts put a whole generation at risk. I'll be speaking to a range of guests, including journalist Michael Schellenberger, best-selling author Helen Joyce, leading physician Dr. Kerry Mendoza, psychotherapist Stella O'Malley, and many more. Find out about one of the biggest medical scandals of the century in Free Speech Nation this Sunday at 7 p.m. on GB News.
and welcome back. It's 3.50 on a Friday afternoon and you're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now at four o'clock, I'll have a reaction to the news that Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Theresa May is quitting. And I'm going to speak to someone who thinks she's brilliant, but it's fair to say that not everyone in my inbox feels the same. In fact, I'd be lying if I said I could find hardly any positive comments about former Prime Minister Theresa May. Let's go through a few of them now. Of course, many of them are focusing around her performance as Prime Minister over Brexit. Robert says this. Theresa May sold our country out to the EU. As far as I'm concerned, she was a traitor. Say what you mean, Rob, next time. Carol says this. Theresa May lied and muddled her way through Brexit. She was the cause of the delay, and basically she just didn't want to leave the European Union. See, bear in mind she inherited a bit of a hospital tackle, didn't she, from David Cameron. David Cameron, lest we forget, who tirelessly campaigned to remain in the European Union, and then the day after he lost, he cleared off. As Danny Dyer might say, he put his trotters up and went on holiday. Theresa May inherited that mess, and being of the philosophical viewpoint that she also wanted to remain, she was never going to get off onto the best wicket, was she? Brad adds this. Personally, I think Theresa May was the worst Tory Prime Minister of all time. She began the Tory rot, and my membership has now ended. Mark is a bit more charitable. He said, I think she was a fence-sitter. She understood the party wanted to stay in Europe. However, she had to do what the people decided. No matter what she did, she would not have been liked for it. And... OK, let's move on now, because Britain has struck a deal with Libya to stem the tide of migrants attempting perilous crossings across the Mediterranean. And the UK will contribute £1 million to support Libya, facilitating voluntary returns of migrants to their home countries. Now, the deal, which was announced by Immigration Minister Michael Tomlinson, aims to curb illegal migration and disrupt the activities of people smuggling gangs. Well, I'm joined now by immigration lawyer Harjip Singh Bangal. Harjip, welcome to the show again. It's got to be said, Hi, it seems like, a, seems like a good idea. Spend a million pounds right far down line, try and cut it off at source. What took them so long? Yeah, finally, a scheme which makes sense. Um, maybe they've listened, been listening to what Keir Starmer's been saying about stop the gangs and taking that on board. But this is the way to get the gangs, is trying to cut them off at the source and disrupt their model. Now, notice the language. They're only talking about voluntary returns. That doesn't deal with the people who don't want to go back. So um, yeah, that's, that's only the people who want to go back uh, are probably going to be few and far between. But something is better than nothing. And uh, these sort of deals and return agreements are something that should have been done not six months before an election, which shows that they can do these things. But like you said, why hasn't this done be, been done before? That leaves a big, big uh, sort of question mark as to around intention and to a political will. And it's got to be said, they're also spending £3 million with Turkey. Now, of course, 90% of illegal boats who land in Britain across the Channel, those people began their journeys into Turkey. So, again, it seems like common sense. Why on earth did it take them so blooming long? Well, it seems as, once again, they've been wasting all their time with the Rwanda scheme. Um, we were talking about Theresa May, you were just now. Remember her bright idea of putting the vans around with go home written on them, hoping that everyone would just read these vans and then go <laughs> home. You know, yeah. this is from the party that gave us this. So um, I, I don't know why it's taken so long. Uh, we can only assume that they've realised that they're about to get a whooping at the election and they've got to do something, and that maybe the uh, British public criticising them has woken them up. But all of okay. this has I'm been afraid possible. We have to leave what it there, Harjip. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. I know you've got loads to say, but I'm afraid we simply ran out of time. But we'll return to that topic, Theresa May. Of course, after the break, more than 60 current MPs, Tory MPs, are about to stand. What could be behind that? I'm Martin Daubney, but first, it's time for your latest weather forecast with Anna e. Shuttleworth. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello there, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it should be staying dry for most of us through the rest of the day, but there will still be a chilly breeze that should last through much of the weekend as well. But through the southwest, it'll start, we'll start to see some showery rain through this evening. That's as this weather front starts to arrive across parts of Devon and Cornwall. So some showery outbreaks of rain to come here. But further north, elsewhere across the country, it should stay dry through this evening and through much of the night. But there'll still be quite a keen easterly breeze and quite a lot of cloud around. That cloud could be thick enough to bring some drizzly rain to parts of eastern Scotland, and but it will be a fairly mild start to the day away from the far northwest of Scotland where there could be a touch of frost in any sheltered areas. There will be a chilly wind though through much of Saturday, especially if you're exposed to the east coast where the breeze will be much stronger. That band of rain will push into parts of northern England, parts of northern Ireland and for much of Wales as well. There's likely to be some outbreaks of rain through the afternoon. Further south though, across central areas, parts of the southeast, it will turn a bit brighter into the afternoon, but there is a risk of some heavy downpours. But in any sunshine, it will feel fairly pleasant with highs for 12 or 13 degrees. Rain's much more likely on Sunday. There'll be some quite persistent and heavy bursts of rain to come, particularly for northern and eastern areas of the country, with some dry spells, but a risk of showers in the west. It does look like that rain will clear away to the east, though, for the start of next week to bring some drier weather again on Tuesday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was and they're going to get even more money this time around, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and and £12,345 in tax-free cash. Text PRIZE to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon and a very happy Friday to you. It's 4pm and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster, 
all across the UK. Today, she danced onto the stage when she was Prime Minister. But like dozens of other Tory MPs, Theresa May will now exit stage right at the next general election. Just why are so many Conservatives quitting? I wonder. Next, Education Secretary Gillian Keegan is in hot water once again, and this time she said she would have probably punched a teaching inspector who apparently was rather rude. Not the smartest thing for an education minister to say, though, is it? And we'll be live at RAF Scampton, where locals are still fighting to stop up to 2,000 migrants being put in the home of the Dambusters. Today is their first anniversary of that protest, and that's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show, and it's always an absolute pleasure to have your company. So I'm asking the question today, was Theresa May the worst Tory Prime Minister they've ever had? Um, or have there been people, candidates, subsequently, who've taken that crown from her? It's fair to say I've now had over 2,000 comments of this. Some of them are even printable. Most people are saying a great constituency MP, but was Theresa May over promotes what I'm about to hear from somebody who thinks she was the best thing since sliced bread. But let me know what you think. Email gbviews at gbnews.com. Get your thoughts in. I'll read out some of the best. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just gone four o'clock and we start with news from Northern Ireland where the First Minister has apologised to the families of alleged informers who were killed by the IRA and says she's wholeheartedly committed to healing wounds of the past. It's after a major investigation found more lives were probably lost than saved by a double agent during the Troubles. Codenamed Steak Knife, he was working covertly for the British Army inside the IRA's internal security unit. Operation Canova, which was conducted by Bedfordshire Police, examined more than 100 murders and abductions linked to that unit. Chief Constable John Butcher, who is now with the police service in Northern Ireland, has said there is strong evidence of very serious criminality. State Knife was undoubtedly a valuable asset who provided intelligence about the IRA at considerable risk to himself, claims that he was responsible for saving countless or hundreds of lives are hugely exaggerated. Most importantly, these claims belie the fact that Steak Knife was himself involved in very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality whilst operating as an agent, including murders. Well, Stegknife is widely believed to have been a West Belfast man who was 77 when he died last year. Solicitor Kevin Winters, who represents a number of the victims' families, says that the agent needs to be identified officially. The decision not to name Fred Scapatisha as the agent Stegknife has been difficult for many to accept. The legal and technical rationale for doing so will be lost on many people, particularly next of kin of those murdered. In other news, Met Police Firearms Officer Martin Blake has denied the murder of Chris Cabber after being named publicly for the first time today. The 24-year-old was shot once in the head through the windscreen of a car in South London in 2022. The officer was initially identified as NX121, but it was now ruled that the 40-year-old can be named because it poses no real risk to his life or that of his family. He has been released on bail and we understand is due to face trial in October. The counter-extremism czar who has warned that London has become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestinian protests. It's after the Prime Minister said forces are trying to tear the country apart. Writing in The Telegraph, Robin Simcox said Rishi Sunak was right to raise concerns about the increased in extremist disruption in the capital. He says policies are needed to meet the scale of the challenges faced and he urged ministers to be bolder and willing to accept higher legal risk when tackling extremism. The Foreign Secretary says it's incredibly frustrating that Israel is not taking steps to allow more aid into Gaza. The UK has announced it will join the US to create a new port on the Strip, providing support and planning and surveying the area. 
However, the Foreign Secretary says there's an option to deliver aid to Gaza immediately while that temporary pier is being constructed. This new idea from the President of the United States, which we're involved in, of building a temporary harbour in Gaza, means that aid will be able to go directly from Cyprus to Gaza. But it's going to take time to build. So the crucial thing is, today, the Israelis must confirm that they'll open the port at Ashdod. That is in Israel, but that's a working port. It could take aid now, that would increase the amount of aid, and that aid can then be driven into Gaza. That would make a real difference, and we need to make a real difference right now. The Education Secretary has said she would have probably punched rude Ofsted staff after hearing about a school inspection. The regulator was heavily scrutinised after the death of head teacher Ruth Perry after her school was downgraded. Addressing school and college leaders, Gillian Keegan says she was shocked to hear about some people's experiences. Well, sources close to the MP have told GB News that her off the cuff comments during a QA were meant to be light-hearted and were not a threat of violence. I've heard from my own, you know, my own constituency, people say, I heard, I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into, um, and, and they said, they told me how the officer, you know, their officer experience had gone, and I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. And finally, the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, will stand down at the next general election, bringing her 27-year career as an MP to an end. Announcing her decision, the member for Maidenhead said she wants to focus instead on causes such as the fight against modern slavery. She's been the Conservative MP for the seat since 1997. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code there on your screen. Or if you're listening on radio, go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thanks, Sam. Now we start with the big news that the Prime the MP, Peggy Bonham from Maidenhead, will not stand at the next general election. Now her name is Theresa May. Now, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's quitting politics just when the Tories seem to be heading for electoral meltdown. There she is, May-botting her way onto a stage. Who can forget, no matter how hard you try to forget, <laughs> to forget that dance? So the letters are about to drop off the stage behind her, as I recall. Now, Mrs May picks up the ultimate poison chat, it's fair to say, in 2016, when she became Prime Minister after the Brexit referendum. And sure enough, after more than two tortuous years in the top job and having spectacularly failed to get Brexit d done, she resigned, just like her predecessor, David Cameron, who legged it and put his trotters up straight after he lost his referendum result. Well, here's what the good people of Maidenhead think of that decision. Good MP for Maidenhead, as far as I can tell. Um, my reaction is that uh, I'm sorry to see her go. She's been a brilliant uh, MP. Uh, I admire her a lot, and it's, it's a shame that she's standing down. Uh, I think she's been a, a good constituency. You know, uh, MP, but uh, um, as a Prime Minister, I think she was uh, lacking somewhat, to say the least. But I think it's a shame she's not didn't have the chance to show what she'd be like as a Prime Minister. And I think the problem is she was scuppered by the right wing of her party. Well, I never vote for Conservatives, but Theresa May was better than well, just Boris Johnson. God. Since, since I've been down here, of course she did a lot for us around here. Well, she still did, it does. You know, she never really had a chance to uh, show, and I think her Brexit would have probably been a preferable one to the one we ended up with. OK, so they love her on the good old streets of Maidenhead, and I'm joined in our studio to discuss this now by our political editor, Chris Hope, and the chief operating officer for the Conservative Friends of the Commonwealth, Sunil Sharma, and I believe Theresa May is your MP, but we'll come to you in a moment. So, Chris... Yes. It's fair to say yes. um, the, the good old people of GB Newsland, yes. my inbox doesn't exactly ring with charm towards no. Theresa May, but <laughs> the people in, in her constituency clearly think she's an extremely competent parliamentarian, but she was handed almost a grenade with the pin pulled out in as far as she didn't like Brexit, she campaigned 
to remain, as did David Cameron before her. In many senses, she was on a hiding to nothing. There are two sides to Theresa May. There's the local MP, and you saw that eloquently expressed by people in, in Maidenhead, and our guest in the studio was saying this off air, what a great MP she is. I mean, she used to go back from those torturous negotiations in Brussels <laughs> before you became a Brexit Party MEP, yeah. Martin, but she'd go back there and she'd be humiliated and really hard trying to find a way through, and then she'd go and uh, feed local people in an old people's mm -hmm. home, um, put on a, a bib to, 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 to look after a fun run. That is the nature of her. She's totally local. She resigned by giving a statement as an MP, giving a statement to the Maidenhead advertiser. I wouldn't tell national journalists mm. that. I mean, I've known her for over 15 years. She's an un unknowable person. Um, having said all that, she did take up the challenge to be Prime Minister when Brexit had been uh, voted on. She mm. knew the challenge. Boris Johnson, of course, had gone away. The question is, would Boris Johnson be better PM, not, not um, Theresa May at that point? I think probably yes, because Theresa May, I think, viewed Brexit as a problem to be mm. solved, not an opportunity to be grasped. And that is the, the, the heart of You boil it all down. Here's someone who didn't really believe in Brexit, was trying to mitigate the more difficult parts of it rather than just charge off and grab the opportunity of Brexit. It was an extraordinary time in the Conservatives Party's history. Um, during that time, the Brexit Party came from nowhere to winning that European election in six weeks. Of course, I was one of those MEPs. I got into politics because of Theresa May's spectacular fame. So you owe her one? Well, I do, in many senses. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm on TV now because of <laughs> Theresa May. <laughs> it is true that many of us were dragged into just getting democracy enacted. And there were Conservative councillors, Conservative MPs, yeah. left, right and centre, saying she's going to destroy our she knew, she knew he did, because she made the offer to Jeremy Corbyn about some kind of cross-party deal yeah. to get her deal through um, Parliament at the expense of maybe 100, 150 Tory MPs who probably would have cleaved off and formed a new party. That was how it mattered to the, to the, uh, that, that much, and those, those meaningful votes we saw just by the end, 28 Spartan Tory MPs opposed it. You know, no question, history will... There are two sides to Theresa May. Um, she did not do well on Brexit, but she's been a very, very good public servant, as all the... Former PM, David Cameron, Richard Sunak making statements to that effect today. And that brings me neatly on to you, Sunil Sharma. You've known Theresa May for a long time. She's your local member of Parliament. So, come on, let's hear the defence <laughs> case for Theresa May. I, I think, you know, alluding to what Chris said, and a phenomenal local MP, some of the times... Um, post these Brexit negotiations, she would be out campaigning on a Saturday, she would have a black notepad, she would be knocking on doors, no fear of the facts of what was going on uh, with the party being in a mess. I think in her defence as PM, I, I do think it, it was the impossible job. I, I look at it as like the, the job after Sir Alex Ferguson at Man United. No matter who got that job, I just think you were destined to failure. You had a party that were in complete disarray. You had the Remainers who refused to accept the result. You had uh, different people within the party wanting different versions of Brexit. And I think if it wasn't for... I think the job after Theresa was always going to be a lot easier because if you speak to a lot of the people within the party, even post-Cameron, uh, the, the party was in, in absolute but, disarray. But, but she lost the party's majority. She went yeah, in yeah. there in 2016 with a majority of, oh, I forget, the, of 50, 20, I can't remember the detail, but then she she, she, believed, the she believed the polls, didn't she, and then yeah. lost the majority. And running a disastrous campaign and the strong and stable Prime Minister. She was weak and wobbly, and that was, that was agreed to by the uh, But I think electorate. that was... I, I think... In some ways, I was almost needed to unite the party. I think at that stage, if you look at some of the Conservative MPs, you know, forget before we talk about the public, that the party couldn't agree on anything. You had members of parliament within the Conservative Party that refused, you know, forget about Theresa May, there was Remainer MPs who refused to accept the result of the referendum. She had different types of Brexit people within her party. I think during those two years, what had gone on with her as PM, it almost united the party into a situation where like, we're in an absolute crisis. We actually need to get behind Brexit, essentially, and you needed somebody with outrageous confidence to do it in a Boris Johnson mm -hmm. profile to but, come. But Theresa May also made some bad decisions when it came to that snap election, she called. Mm. you remember the dementia attacks? I yeah. mean, oh, my God. And the fox-hunting reprieve. It almost cost the Conservative Party that election. Corbyn almost got in. Unbelievably. Um, I was the journalist who actually said to her when she emerged at the Welsh Tories manifesto launch, Martin, and, and we knew that the U-turn was coming, and I said to her, what else will change, Prime Minister? And she said, 
nothing has changed. Yeah. Nothing has changed to me. And that became the moment which defined uh, that, that election that she mm. couldn't recognise. In fact, you can't rewrite parts of your manifesto. As you know, when you ran for, mm. for office, that manifesto is yeah. it has a kind of holy just, text so you can't yeah. be touched. What do you think she'd be remembered for, apart from the dancing and the letters falling off and repeating like a robot Brexit Well, means she was Brexit. Home Secretary for, 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 for um, all the time that David Cameron was Prime Minister. I think her response from the Salisbury poisonings was really strong. I think she uh, threw out Russia Russian diplomat. She built a coalition of, of of the willing amongst other allies on the world mm. stage. That was really strong. I think she, you know, she she kept the lid on that job. So being Home Secretary, no one is Home Secretary for six years, right? Mm. But she yeah. was because she, she ran that off the Home Office with an iron rule. She would say, were she here, um, the modern slavery legislation she pushed through was was up, would be up there along with the mm. fact she promoted women um, as, as Prime Minister. And Sunil in Maidenhead, do you think um, she would? Always be fondly remembered. She'll always have a glass of wine bought for her in the local oh, taverns for, when she walks in. For sure, she she put Maynard on the map. I think prior to her, I don't think many people knew Maynard existed un until she became Home Secretary and obviously Prime Minister. I think her work in Maynard is second to none. The commitment she's done, whether it's Home Secretary, PM, now as a backbencher. I mean, she was out last weekend campaigning. This is a, a relentless worker, uh, somebody with incredible work ethic. I think, of, of course, as PM, I think we can all look back and say that wasn't our greatest PM by any stretch of the imagination. But mm. I think as a, as a parliamentarian, I think there's very few that will be that are better than her, to be honest. And she'd probably do rather well after politics. I mean, most former prime ministers do. She's already talking about her role in, in ending the slave trade. So she'd be very, modern, very... Modern well, slavery. Modern slavery. She'd be very, very well connected in that. And you would assume she would take up an ambassadorial, well-paid job on the world stage. Or, or a place in the House of Lords. I asked uh, Number 10 today, will she get a period? period? And she, it is one if she wants one, I reckon. And I'm sure she won't be lost to public life. She did say very clearly, I'm giving up... I, to, I can't give the time I want to to the people of Maidenhead. At the same time as I do my work on modern slavery, so she's not going to stop. And uh, I think you know, I think it's, just, it's it's a nuanced view. I think Brexit is clouding our viewers and listeners' mm. judgments, and that's understandable. But as you're eloquently saying, there is a, a side to her which you're a local MP, which is right right to discuss. Okay, thank you very much, Chris Hope, Sunil Sharma. Thank you very much for joining us in the studio discussing the resignation and the legacy of former Prime Minister Theresa May. Now, we'll have lots more on this story after five o'clock, and there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. You've helped make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country, so thank you very much. Now, to a story that I can tell you has got many, many firearms officers in this country absolutely fuming. Now, the Met's police marksman who shot dead Chris Cabber has been named publicly for the first time. Martin Blake denied murder when he appeared at the Old Bailey today. And to discuss this, I'm now joined by our home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, a very, very controversial case, and the naming of this officer has caused huge consternation amongst police officers. Yeah, there's a great deal of upset, and we wait to see what exactly will be the response of many of these firearms officers attached to the Metropolitan Police Firearms Command. When this officer was charged in September of last year, hundreds mm. of the Met's firearms officers decided they were going to step back from their armed duties. That caused a real crisis within the Metropolitan Police and we saw them having to call for mutual aid for firearms officers from other police forces to come into London to help out. And indeed, the military was put on standby at one point as well as this crisis really intensified. Uh, things have settled down a bit since then, uh, but clearly this is another flashpoint now that this man, Martin Blake, a 40-year-old serving firearms officer within that firearms command at the Metropolitan Police has been named. He appeared at the Old Bailey today to deny a charge of murder, that he murdered 24-year-old Chris Cabba. Now, Mr Cabba was driving an Audi, not his own Audi, in Streatham in South London on the 5th of September 2022. It was connected to firearms offences from the previous day and armed officers tried to stop that vehicle. In this operation to stop the vehicle in Streatham, a shot was fired through the front windscreen 
of this car which struck Mr. Kaba in the head. He died in hospital the next again day. Uh, there was a lot of anger uh, on the streets of South London in connection with this incident. A decision was then taken a year later to charge this officer with murder. As I say, that caused, again, a reaction from those firearms officers who say they realise they're not above the law, uh, but they want the authorities to take into account the fact that they have to make split-second decisions in very difficult circumstances trying to keep Londoners safe. Um, so, as I say, we await to see what the reaction of those firearms officers will be to this latest development. If they walk out en masse again, expect another crisis at a time when the Metropolitan Police and, of course, firearms officers in urban centres of population right across the UK are dealing with some very significant and serious violent crime. Indeed, Mark White, the timing could not be worse if those officers decide to down tools. Thank you very much, Mark White, our home and security editor. Now, moving on, you could win the spring essentials in our latest great British giveaway. That's a garden gadget package, a shopping spree, and £12,345. One, two, three, four, five in cash. And here's all the details you need to enter. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Great stuff. Now, it's exactly one year since the RF, RAF base. There was a historic home of the Dambusters was going to house up to 2,000 asylum seekers. And locals there are still fighting their corner and will join them soon. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. I'm Nigel Farage, and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Well, we've been a constitutional monarchy since the late 17th century, and of course, part of that deal is that the monarch, or indeed the close immediate royal family, should not interfere with politics that in any way could be seen to affect individual parties. Now, perhaps one of the most classic cases in the 20th century was Edward VIII, who during his brief reign went down to Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales, met thousands of people who'd lost their jobs in the steel industry. In fact, he shook so many hands in the end, he had to change and shake with his left hand. And he said something must be done to get these people jobs. It was taken as a direct assault on the Conservative government of the day. And we could go on to Edward Heath, as many saw it, using the Queen to get us to join the common market and things the Queen said uh, during the referendum on Scottish separation. And we could, of course, could talk about King Charles, who was Prince of Wales, endlessly talked about climate change and net zero. But the intervention overnight from Prince William, I think, is the most direct Politically, a political piece of interference that has international and global implications that I almost think we've ever seen. Prince William is saying to Israel, stop what you're doing. Some will see that as being given a free pass to Hamas. Many young people will say, hooray, he's doing the right thing. But whether he's doing the right thing or not, has he gone just too far with this? Should our future king intervene in this way. I don't, 
believe that he should. I think he's making a very big mistake. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6pm. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6pm on GB News. Welcome back. It's 4.26. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, I'll have the very latest royal news. But before that, protesters are demonstrating against a decision to house asylum seekers at RAF Scampton. And it's exactly one year today since the Home Office planned to put 2,000 migrants there were revealed as the government tries to reduce its reliance on expensive hotels. Well, joining me now is Save Our Scampton campaigner Sarah Carter. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us on the show. One year on and you're still doggedly protesting on. What's the latest on the ground? Do you think you're any nearer to stopping this? Or are you still fearful, as many are, that they will still press on and put 2,000 military-aged men in the historic base of Dambusters RAF Scampton? What? Well, you have to remember that we're dealing with the Home Office here, so nothing is ever clear. Um, I mean, we, we're nearly at the end of Section Q, which is the emergency powers. The Home, home Office have given themselves to be able to use Scampton for the last year. So we're nearly at the end of that. And as yet, they've not submitted um, an application for an SDO, which would give them three years more um, planning permission. So we're, we're just sort of on tenterhooks at the moment, waiting to find out what the, what the next move is. And Sarah, can you explain to those who may not be fully up to speed with your protests just why, in your mind, this site is completely unsuitable for the purpose the Home Office is intending? Uh, it, it's unsuitable on so many levels. For the, for the fact that they've admitted that we will actually be um, an experiment because they've not done a site like this before, not with such a huge number, but also so close to a residential estate and also bordering a, a primary school as well. So th that on one level, the fact that the local council have been working for 15 years to make sure that when RAF Scampton closed, it was not just going to become another housing estate or an industrial estate, and it was actually going to have its history and its heritage protected. So, you know, £300 million of private investment into Lincolnshire, another reason. It's just on every level, it's the wrong idea. And Sarah, with crushing predictability, sadly, great swathes of the media would refer to people like you as far-right extremists. What would you say to that? <laughs> I, I, I say to them, look, if you're going to call me racist, then you might as well call me sexist as well, because they're planning to put 2,000 men here. Where do you draw the line at the name calling? Mm. But how does it make you feel when concerned members of the community with legitimate concerns for safety, for overcrowding, for the pressure on public services, all of that is totally legitimate, and yet your legitimate um, issues are just smeared and brushed aside as if you don't matter? What does that make you feel about the priorities that Britain is placing upon its own citizens? 
It, it's really frustrating. I mean, you're speaking to people that sort of live in the area, you, you get to hear their concerns on a, on a daily basis. And to, to have the Home Office saying that they are consulting with us it is sort of beyond a joke. We have meetings with the Home Office and they, they give us a lecture and we ask them questions and we never get the answers to that. They just don't seem to know themselves what, what is happening. And Sarah, it's one year on now. It's the birthday, a birthday none of you no doubt wanted to get to. And yet here you are doggedly fighting on. What's next? What's the future? When does this end? Well, there's no celebration and definitely no cake today, but um, what's next? We're going to carry on fighting. We're, we're not giving up. We're, we're going to be a thorn in the Home Office's side until they've actually withdrawn from this. And um, I know that Sir Edward Lee was talking today and mentioning about maybe having a compromise, but even if you stick 200 migrants in the, the accommodation block here, with, with regards to saving money, which is why they wanted to use Scampton, that's only going to save £2,000 a day out of you know, a potential eight million. Is it really worth risking a delay on the Heritage Centre to save two thousand pounds a day? Okay, well Sarah Carter from Save Our Scampton campaign. A great many people I'm sure watching this will be very, very appreciative of what you're doing and they'll be very, very thankful for you for taking a stand not just for RAF Scampton, not just for Scampton, but perhaps for the entire country. Sarah Carter, happy first birthday and I really, really hope you get the resolution you want. Thank you. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock, and I'll speak to the former police officer who went undercover to expose a woke police course. You will not believe your eyes and ears on this one. But first, here's your latest new headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. Just coming up to 4.32, the top story. A major independent investigation has found that it's likely more lives were lost than saved by a double agent who was embedded in the IRA during the Troubles. The individual, codenamed Steakknife, was working covertly for the British Army inside the IRA's internal security unit. Operation Canova examined more than 100 murders and abductions linked to that unit and found strong evidence of very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality. Met Police Firearms Officer Martin Blake has denied the murder of Chris Cabber after being named publicly for the first time. The 24-year-old was shot once in the head through the windscreen of a car in South London in September 2022. The officer, who was initially identified as NX121, has been released on bail and is due to face trial in October. Lord David Cameron says it's incredibly frustrating that Israel's not taking steps to allow more aid into Gaza. His comments come after the UK announced it will join the US to create a new port on the Strip. However, the Foreign Secretary says Ashdod port in Israel could also be opened immediately so that aid can be delivered while the temporary pier is being constructed. And finally, to royal news, Prince William has visited the Oval Cricket Ground to celebrate an Earthshot Prize winner. He was welcomed this afternoon by the chair of Surrey County Cricket Club before meeting with that winner, Pierre Paslier, who secured a multi-million pound deal to provide eco-packaging for sporting venues. His products are set to be used at over 50 venues, including the Oval, Wimbledon and the O2 Arena. Those are the headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Sam. Top man. Now, the Prince of Wales has been out and about today. I'm about to tell you exactly what the Prince has been up to. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase. You know what I mean? Like anyone who talks about anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right because that's what that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is of course about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub 
into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her, uh, touching her zip, because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's, she's She's making that symbol. Yeah, but she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and also, <laughs> also, this isn't a far right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, this she's, is she's, a just, Wait, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far right. But also, I mean... even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an? One of the most important issues of our day. What well, are Labour playing out here? They're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you they say won't. that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10am every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 4.37 is your time and you're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, Prince William is back in action <clears throat> with health concerns surrounding his wife, the Princess of Wales, and of course his father, King Charles. Questions were beginning to be asked about the heir to the throne's whereabouts as well. But today, the Prince of Wales was seen gloriously out and about at the Oval Cricket Ground, just down the road from me. So our Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker is here to tell us more. Cameron, welcome to the show. What's going on? The Prince knocking in for six. Well, Martin, this exactly. This appears to be a new type of royal engagement for the Prince of Wales. I understand and I'm getting the sense that he's moving away from doing, carrying out lots of public uh, uh, engagements around the country and instead focusing on a lot of work behind the scenes to have something which he hopes will have tangible impacts. And what I mean by that is, for example, his Earthshot Prize, which he launched in 2020, finding different solutions to repair our planet over the next decade. Kensington Palace announced this morning that one of the Earthshot winners, Notzpla, which is a, a start-up which uh, won the Revive Our Oceans category, which has found a way to create food packaging out of seaweed rather than plastic, a new multi-million pounds deal between them and Levy UK and Ireland, which is the UK's largest uh, sport and entertainment caterer in the country, supplying over 50 stadiums, including the Oval uh, here in London, with that food packaging in the, in the food. And this partnership is expected, I'm told, to see 75 million plastic-free disposable food containers um, be used around the country in these stadiums, which means less plastic clogging up our oceans over, uh, over the next few years. That's the idea. So from a small start-up before the Earthshot Prize to scaling up across the country and potentially the world. But I'm told, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm told that Prince William has been working hours and hours and hours behind the scenes trying to get this deal to happen. So here is the co-founder of Notpla, Pierre, to explain how Prince William got involved. 
He's been really involved in creating more connections within the sports industry. I mean, as president of the FA, uh, one of the first conversations we had with him was, there's got to be something we can do between kind of like sports and sustainability to accelerate the, the transition. Very generous with his time and he's been coming physically to our office to meet our partners and basically tell them how do we go faster and that obviously makes a, a huge difference in uh, in getting everyone kind of like excited on board and, and just kind of like making this a reality. Now it's a danger Royal fans will be disappointed for not seeing Prince William out and about as often as perhaps he would be. The late Queen famously thought that Royals had to be seen to be believed but aides insist that public engagements are still going to continue and in fact he's due to appear in public on Monday at Westminster Abbey for the Commonwealth Day service. Great stuff, and that's Cameron Walker there at the Oval Cricket Stadium in Vauxhall. Thank you very much. Not sure about um, seaweed-based food packaging. Well, my chips taste like the sea. Anyway, last month, Staffordshire Police held a training day for the local community, and you will not believe what they are telling people. More trans and pronouns madness. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it should be staying dry for most of us through the rest of the day, but there will still be a chilly breeze that should last through much of the weekend as well. But through the southwest, it'll start, we'll start to see some showery rain through this evening. That's as this weather front starts to arrive across parts of Devon and Cornwall. So some showery outbreaks of rain to come here. But further north, elsewhere across the country, it should stay dry through this evening and through much of the night. But there'll still be quite a keen easterly breeze and quite a lot of cloud around. That cloud could be thick enough to bring some drizzly rain to parts of eastern Scotland. And, but it will be a fairly mild start to the day away from the far northwest of Scotland where there could be a touch of frost in any sheltered areas. There will be a chilly wind though through much of Saturday, especially if you're exposed to the east coast where the breeze will be much stronger. That band of rain will push into parts of northern England, parts of Northern Ireland and for much of Wales as well. There's likely to be some outbreaks of rain through the afternoon. Further south though, across central areas, parts of southeast, it will turn a bit brighter into the afternoon, but there is a risk of some heavy downpours but in any sunshine it will feel fairly pleasant with highs for 12 or 13 degrees rains much more likely on Sunday there'll be some quite persistent and heavy bursts of rain to come particularly for northern and eastern areas of the country with some dry spells but a risk of showers in the west it does look like that rain will clear away to the east though for the start of next week to bring some drier weather again on Tuesday I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. It's 4.44. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, at 5 o'clock, I'll have lots of reaction to the news that the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, you might remember her, she's quitting. I'll also be reading out lots of your emails. It's fair to say not everyone in my inbox has been too complimentary about the former Prime Minister, the May bot. In fact, we've had to look very hard to find something positive. Now, moving on, last month, Staffordshire Police held a training day for the local community. Did they let kids have a look around the station? Maybe let them wear a, a copper's hat? Or maybe they let people meet their sniffer dogs? I mean, who doesn't love a Springer Spaniel? No, none of that, not a jot of that. Instead, Staffordshire Police let a group which claimed gender-critical views or hate speech to carry out a training day. Staffordshire Police was criticised for permitting the organisation to carry out an inappropriate and inaccurate course in February. Now, the session was delivered by the group Uniting Staffordshire Against Hate at the Forces HQs and members of the public. And I'm joined now by the gender critical We Are Fair Cop group who attended undercover, the boss of which is my old mate. Harry Miller. <laughs> Harry, you went undercover to expose these um, people. What did you find? Why did you do it? Well, I did it because the Staffordshire Police made the mistake of putting out a call for hate crime champions. So I thought, I know, I'll apply to become a hate crime champion. Now, I thought they would recognise the name Harry Miller, having beaten uh, the police on numerous occasions, but they didn't. Uh, so I, I went out to Staffordshire and I was... I had a day's training in hate crime so that I could be part of the citizen Stasi that is able to detect hate speech wherever we find it. It was an absolute, utter disaster. Tell us about some of their, their materials and their messaging. Well, first of all, they had no idea what a crime was. They didn't understand that you cannot have a hate crime without, first of all, having a crime. That's the first thing. Major, major error. But then they went on to tell us about unconscious bias, and they identified 150 different types of unconscious bias. They didn't name them. They just told us there were 150. And they said all of this was flawed thinking. I said, well, hold on a minute. This may not necessarily be true. Let's take, for instance, the, uh, a woman who is walking down a, a dark street at night, and her unconscious bias warns her that the, the footsteps behind her are those of an unknown male. And as a result of that, she tells takes defensive action and moves away. I was told that this was the equivalent of racism, <laughs> that the woman judging the unknown footsteps was the same as a racist, and we needed to get rid of this unconscious bias. Gender-critical women, uh, we, we were told that they were the equivalent of right-wing fascists, uh, which is entirely untrue. And we were told by a, a poet called George the Poet, we were subjected to a 10 to 15 minute sort of rap poet by George the Poet. And he said that the defining characteristic of hate crime is not, is not crime or hate, it's prejudice. Well, it's not. The police should know that the defining characteristic of any crime is a crime. Mens rea plus actus reus minus a defence. And then it becomes a hate crime if the motivation is seen as hostility towards a protected characteristic. Now, Harry, uh, we can roll our eyes, we can scoff, we can laugh, we can flick their noses and laugh and laugh in their faces, but this is being taught as actual law. And if coppers are going out there and somehow enforcing this law or nosing around on social media, we've got a problem. Oh, we have it, absolutely. And the Staffordshire Police have been entirely disingenuous about this. Once I called them out and we had over a million views, and they said, oh, it was just simply a community discussion. And by the way, Harry Miller, you're not from Staffordshire, so you shouldn't be there. Entirely missing the point. Wrong. It was a hate crime champions training day. People were being trained to grass up on their neighbours. People were being trained to spot hate in a slice of toast. That's what they were, that's what they were being told to do. Now, the police were not able to um, identify what crime was, they weren't able to identify what genuine hate was, they weren't uh, able to identify anything that was of any value to a citizen who wants to have a better, more, pe more peaceful, more mm. secure, more law-abiding world. It was Stasi. That's exactly what it was. Harry, I looked into crime in Staffordshire. Here's some headlines that came up. Number of theft arrests in Staffordshire, Hobbs in five years. Police solved just eight burglaries in East Staffordshire in the past 12 months. 71% of burglaries 
burglaries in Staffordshire go unsolved. Crime in Staffordshire is 15% above the national average. Why are they wasting the time on this nonsense? I've absolutely no idea. Well, I do know why they're doing it. They're doing it because they've prioritised the politics of the LGBT community, left-wing politics, Black Lives Matter politics, eco-politics, over and above genuine crime. They look down on people who have burglaries. They look down on people who suffer assaults. These are not important enough crimes because they're not political crimes. And in that sense, they operate just like the Stasi. During my case in, uh, in 2020 against Chief Constable of Humberside, Mr Justice Knoll said, we've never had a Stasi, a Cheka or a Gestapo in this country. Well, we are. We, we're getting them. That's the problem. Mm. Mr Justice Knowles, I don't think he was being hyperbolic. I think what he was being was he saw the direction of travel that the police were travelling toward. Mm. And we're now there. We are now there. We have hate crime champions within our neighbourhoods, just like the Stasi, who could not distinguish a crime from a sausage loaf. Seriously. It's, the thing is, Harry, though, of course, you know, a lot of coppers, a lot of rank-and-file bobbies on the beat, they, they don't like this stuff either. They, they wish they could just be police officers. Is it the people at the bottom that's the problem, or is it just bad information trickling down that's the issue? It's bad information trickling down. It's because police and crime commissioners have not done their job. What, what PCCs need to do is fire chief constables. Chief constables have not done their job. What they need to do is police without fear or favour and get rid of anything that looks political. This has left fair cop doing the job of the Chief Constable and the PCC, which is trying to rid our police forces of all political influence and get back to doing what Mr Peel uh, first imagined, which was policing without fear or favour. And I believe that when you put this out, uh, a certain J.K. Rowling got involved and signal boosted it. Yeah, absolutely, J.K. Rowling uh, signal boosted it and um, Jordan Peterson followed us uh, because it's a message that resonates with people. We want a police force that we can be proud of. And what we have at the moment is a police force which is more in common with the Stasi than it does with the, the, the Bobby on the beat. Now, most police officers are good, honest, hard-working uh, men and women. They loathe this stuff, absolutely mm. hate it. Uh, they contact me all the time, send me information through so that I can then challenge the, the police force on their behalf because they're terrified. They're likely to lose their job if they challenge any of this. Well, no doubt, Harry Miller, they regret letting you through the cat flap. And anyway, we've got a spokesperson... A comment we have to read out from Staffordshire Police who said this. This event was delivered and facilitated by Uniting Staffordshire Against Hate and was solely for members of our local community. The session aimed to stimulate conversation and enable sharing of a wide range of views with the intention of encouraging tolerance and increasing understanding of the impact of hate crime. Harry Miller, thank you very much for joining us in the studio. Now let's quickly move on. Let's go stateside because US President Joe Biden has used his State of the Union speech to take a swipe at his Republican rival Donald Trump. Biden said the former president sought to bury the truth about the 2021 January the 6th attack on the US Capitol, whilst he also used a speech to condemn his recent comments about NATO and Russia. The former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> Now, this whole event, historically, the State of the Union is literally about the state of the United States. It's a presidential address to the nation where they normally talk about things like the economy or immigration or schools or, you know, the things people seem to care about. This, however, was a very carefully scripted and PR'd attempt to show, to address the critics of Joe Biden, that after all, look, I'm in control of my faculties. All those rumours about me, they're not true at all. And it also turned into a huge rallying point where he steamed into Donald Trump. It became, in effect, a presidential nomination, almost like he fired the starting gun on his campaign. Now, my point is, is this the right use of the State of the Union? The Liberal media, it has to be said, they've absolutely lapped it up, despite his constant gaffes and the fact he falls up more stairs than I've had hot dinners. They're going, yep, yeah, he's our man, we're going to back him. Now, quickly, before the end of this minute, I want to read through a few of your emails. 
on the topic of the day, and that is the resignation of Theresa May ahead of the general election. And here's a few of them, a few of them that were allowed to read out on telly. Michael says this, I'm sad to hear Theresa May leaving at the next election. I'm not a Tory supporter, but when May resigned as Prime Minister, it showed how much that she loves this country. Kath quickly says this, I used to like Theresa May, but lost faith in her when she kept crawling to the EU. Theresa May never really had her heart in it to leave the EU. Now then, if you had hopes that the huge pro-Palestine protests were about to end, then I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed tomorrow. In a few minutes, I'll discuss the rights and wrongs of those demonstrations and we'll have a shocking video which shows some pro-Palestinian protesters going just stop oil with some added extra vandalism on the top. They've gone completely nuts and damaged a painting. You will not believe your eyes. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News. But first, it's time for your latest weather forecast with Annie Shuttleworth. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it should be staying dry for most of us through the rest of the day, but there will still be a chilly breeze that should last through much of the weekend as well. But through the southwest, it'll start, we'll start to see some showery rain through this evening. That's as this weather front starts to arrive across parts of Devon and Cornwall. So some showery outbreaks of rain to come here. But further north, elsewhere across the country, it should stay dry through this evening and through much of the night. But there'll still be quite a keen easterly breeze and quite a lot of cloud around. That cloud could be thick enough to bring some drizzly rain to parts of eastern Scotland, and but it will be a fairly mild start to the day away from the far northwest of Scotland, where there could be a touch of frost in any sheltered areas. There will be a chilly wind, though, through much of Saturday, especially as you're exposed to the east coast, where the breeze will be much stronger. That band of rain will push into parts of northern England, parts of Northern Ireland, and for much of Wales as well. There's likely to be some outbreaks of rain through the afternoon. Further south, across central areas, parts of southeast. It will turn a bit brighter into the afternoon, but there is a risk of some heavy downpours. But in any sunshine, it will feel fairly pleasant with highs for 12 or 13 degrees. Rain's much more likely on Sunday. There'll be some quite persistent and heavy bursts of rain to come, particularly for northern and eastern areas of the country, with some dry spells, but a risk of showers in the west. It does look like that rain will clear away to the east, though, for the start of next week to bring some drier weather again on Tuesday. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 45 pounds in tax-free cash text gb win to 84902 text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to gb03 po box 8690 derby de1 nine double t uk only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m on friday the 29th of march full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, you wonderful people, and a very happy Friday. It's 5 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dalton Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, a huge pro-Palestine protest is set to take place in London once again tomorrow after the government's counter-extremism saw said London streets have now become a no-go zone for Jews during the demonstrations. Well, if you ask me, they're a no-go zone for anybody who disagrees with them. Next, she danced on the, on the stage when she was Prime Minister. There she is doing the Maybot. But like dozens of other Tory MPs, Theresa May will exit stage right at the next general election. Just why are so many Conservatives quitting? Hmm, I wonder. And Education Secretary Gillian Keegan is in hot water once again. She said she had probably punched a teaching inspector who apparently was being really rude. But it's not really the smartest thing for an education minister to say, is it? That and much more is all coming up in your next hour. Thank you very much for joining us on this Friday afternoon. I want to hear from you. GB Views at GBNews.com, the usual way. First of all, we've had hundreds. In fact, we've had now almost 2,000 emails around the topic of Theresa May. Was she the worst ever Conservative Prime Minister? Or have people that came after her stolen that crown from her? Get in touch that way. I'll read out some of the ones that are a bit more polite, shall I say. Plus... I've got an absolutely shocking video of a Palestine action group. They've done what Just Stop Oil have done to a painting, but they've gone a step further. They've absolutely destroyed a painting. I'll have that video for you shortly. And that on the eve of another pro-Palestine march. And we've declared no-go zone areas for Jews because of that. Loads more coming in an action-packed hour ahead. But first, it's your latest news headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you very much. Good evening from the GB newsroom. Just gone five o'clock and we start with news from Northern Ireland, where the First Minister has today apologised to families of the alleged informers who were killed by the IRA and says she's wholeheartedly committed to healing wounds of the past. It's after a major investigation found more lives were probably lost than saved by a double agent during the Troubles. Codenamed Steak Knife, he was working covertly for the British Army inside the IRA's internal security unit. Operation Canova, which was conducted by Bedfordshire Police, examined more than 100 murders and abductions linked to that unit. Chief Constable John Butcher, who's now with the Pub Police Service in Northern Ireland, says there's strong evidence of very serious criminality. Steak Knife was undoubtedly a valuable asset who provided intelligence about the IRA at considerable risk to himself, claims that he was responsible for saving countless or hundreds of lives are hugely exaggerated. Most importantly, these claims belie the fact that Steak Knife was himself involved in very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality whilst operating as an agent, including murders. Well, Steak Knife is widely believed to have been a West Belfast man who was 77 when he died last year. Solicitor Kevin Winters, who represents a number of the victims' families, 
says the agent needs to be identified officially. The decision not to name Fred Scapatisha as the agent steak knife has been difficult for many to accept. The legal and technical rationale for doing so will be lost on many people, particularly next of kin of those murdered. Met Police Firearms Officer Martin Blake has denied the murder of Chris Cabber after being named publicly today for the first time. The 24-year-old was shot once in the head through the windscreen of a car in South London in September of 2022. The officer was initially identified as NX121, but it was ruled that the 40-year-old can now be named because it poses no real risk to his life or that of his family. He's been released on bail and is due to face trial in October of this year. The counter-extremism SAR has warned London has become a no-go zone for Jews during pro-Palestinian protests. It's after the Prime Minister said forces are trying to tear the country apart. Writing in The Telegraph, Robin Simcox said Rishi Sunak was right to raise concerns about the increase in extremist disruption. And he says policies are needed to meet the scale of the challenges faced. And he's urged ministers to be bolder and willing to accept higher legal risk when they tackle extremism. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary has said it's incredibly frustrating that Israel's not taking more steps to allow aid into Gaza. The UK has announced it will join the US to create a new port on the Strip, providing support on planning and surveying the area. However, the Foreign Secretary says there's an option to deliver aid to Gaza immediately while that temporary pier is being constructed. This new idea from the President of the United States, which we're involved in, of building a temporary harbour in Gaza, means that aid will be able to go directly from Cyprus to Gaza. But it's going to take time to build. So the crucial thing is, today, the Israelis must confirm that they'll open the port at Ashdod. That is in Israel, but that's a working port. It could take aid now, that would increase the amount of aid, and that aid can then be driven into Gaza. That would make a real difference, and we need to make a real difference right now. No. Well, as Martin mentioned at the top of his programme, uh, historic artwork has today been damaged by a group of pro-Palestinian activists at Cambridge University. If you're watching on TV, you can see here pictures uh, from the social media account of that pro-Palestinian group, of the painting of former Prime Minister Lord Balfour being sprayed, you can see there, with red paint, before being slashed apart. The government's adviser on political violence and disruption has described it as outrageous and senseless. The Palestine Action Group has claimed the piece symbolised the bloodshed of the Palestinian people since the Balfour Declaration. The Education Secretary said she would have probably punched rude Ofsted staff after hearing about a school inspection. Addressing school and college leaders, Gillian Keegan says she was shocked to hear about some people's experiences. Well, sources close to the MP say her off-the-cuff comments during the Q&A were meant to be light-hearted and were not a threat of violence. I've heard from my own, you know, my own constituency, people say, I heard, I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into, um, and, and they said, they told me how the officer, you know, their officer experience had gone, and I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. That's it from me for now. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, though, it's back to Martin in Westminster. Thank you, Sam. Now we start this hour on reports of a new anti-Islamophobia czar being named by the government. It's part of a major crackdown launched by Michael Gove. And Fiaz Magal is in the running to get that job. And he's been critical of the government's approach to tackling extremism in the past. And all this comes as the government's counter-extremism czar has called London a no-go zone for Jews. Well, I'm joined now in our studio to discuss this by our political editor, Christopher Hope, and political commentator and great friend of the show and it's Donald Trump tie, <laughs> Matthew Stadlin. Welcome to you both. Let's go first to you, Chris Hope. So, um, in the budget this week, 
There was a million pounds to a Muslim war memorial after huge allegations of Islamophobia sparked in large by what Lee Anderson said on this show two weeks ago today. Now, an announcement of an anti Islamiazar. What does that role entail and who might be in it? This role is described as anti Islamophobiazar, but of course the government doesn't define Islamophobia, does it? It tried to do this a few years ago and then gave up doing it. It's an anti Muslim hatred advisor, is a technical term. This person will be appointed probably next week. Fayez Mughal uh, is, is one of the leading candidates to take the job. He runs a counter extremism group called Faith Matters, Tell Mama. Um, he, in the past, has been very critical of the government's prevent strategy. He supported the William Shawcross report by, commissioned by Swella Braveman, the then Home Secretary, in February last year. It found that, um, that, that, that this prevent strategy was, in fact, um, it was actually squandering, on, being squandered money, our, our money, taxpayers' money, being squandered on people who are over maintaining the status quo. Is it getting the wrong people? So he's been quite critical of the way the prevent money has been spent. That is a soft um, uh, power uh, uh, pool of money given out to community groups trying to bring on and stop people being r radicalised in the Muslim community. So they are. this is what I'll announce next week. It goes back to a week ago when the PM was on the steps of Downing Street saying that, that radical extremism left and right is pulling this country apart. Our democracy is under, is under threat, he said. And next week we'll see probably the, the, the definition of what extremism is. So next week we're going to see some actual meat on the bone set out by the PM last Friday. What does the role entail? I mean, we, we hear all the time of there's been a 700% boom in anti-Semitism. There's no anti-Semitism, Zor. Why do we need an anti -S Well, there is, there is actually. There's a, this, uh, Lord Mann, John Mann, is the, anti the government's advisor on, on, on anti-Semitism. And this have almost equalises that. There was previously a candidate who, who was appointed in, in 2019. Uh, he, he did leave the role um, and he had been appointed. He's called uh, Iman Kari Azim. He was appointed to try and produce a definition of Islamophobia. They gave up in 2022. I think that position is getting increasingly untenable because it's important, I mean, they, and we saw it with, with um, our, our colleague, but at the time as a Tory MP speaking to us about extremism, saying that uh, he felt that um, Sadiq Khan had been captured by uh, his, his mates, he said it, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, is, Islamist uh, people. I mean, he said that, and he said, you, you, you know, it's not defined Islamophobia, and that's part of the problem. I think what we're going to have here is an attempt by the government to reach out to the communities in, 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 in this, in, in the Muslim community, and get them on side mm -hmm. and try and say, here's someone who's looking after your interests. Okay, Matthew Stan, I'd like to turn to you now. Why are they doing this? For, for example, um, the million pound statue, the war memorial statue, do you think that's a cynical attempt almost by a government to, to buy their way into the notion that they're not... They've been accused of Islamophobia a lot in the past and now appointing Azar. Is it because they care or is it because they've been forced into it? Difficult for me to get into the minds and the heads of the government. As you probably know, I'm not a fan of this Conservative government. In and of itself, I think it's a good thing because mm. perhaps not enough of us in this country realise the very, very important role that Muslims played in fighting in the First yeah. World War and in the Second World War against fascism and against Nazism. Not, by the way, just Muslims, but Hindus and Sikhs and people from the Caribbean. Mm. We kind of tend to look back at that part of our history, some of us, not me, and imagine that it was white people. It wasn't. We were already, to an extent, not to the extent that we are today, diverse. So recognising that, I think, is vital. And this government has had a problem with Islamophobia. And we talk about Suella Bravham. She was, until recently, Martin, the Home Secretary. She has said that Islamists and anti-Semites, and I say this as someone who's Jewish myself, are in control now. They're not in control now. Rishi Sunak's government is in control. The police, I would argue, are largely in control. And to say that anti-Semites and Islamists are in control is deliberately to fan the flames of division in this country when the government's role should be to bring us together. Should okay. there be a definition, Mark, of, 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 of Islamophobia as a reason of anti-Semitism? I don't see what the big problem with it is. I mean, anti-Semitism seems to me to be prejudice against or hatred of nastiness towards Jewish people, yeah, right? But, it's a, but that's and people, that, that's individuals. That, yes, Islam it is. Mm. is a religion. Islamophobia mm. is not a race. Islam or, or, and, well, and you could argue that Jews are not a race, right? You can convert to Judaism. 
when it comes to Islamophobia, what do I understand it? What do I think most people watching this show today will understand it as? It is, similarly to anti-Semitism, prejudice against Muslims, sometimes hatred against Muslims. Now, should we be... Phobia is an irrational sh fear, it's not prejudice. Sh should we be free, Martin, to criticise the Muslim religion? Yes. Or the Jewish religion? Yes. Absolutely, we should. Because it's, to, I'm, I'm an agnostic. To me, all mm. religion is fair game. Yeah. Should we be prejudiced against people? No. But when you criticise, um, if only that were the case, but the Batley Grammar School teacher, three years on the 25th of March, has been in hiding. It's proof pudding that if you criticise Islam, there's a well, danger. What do we know? We know that there, there is Islamophobia in this country. We also know that we've got an Islamism mm. problem in this country. We've got some very bad people who describe themselves as Muslim. We've got some extremists. That's not the mm. overwhelming, the vast of majority of British Muslims. OK, I, I have a quick quote to read out here. It's from Commander Karen Findlay, who will oversee policing across London tomorrow. Of course, there's another pro-Palestine march going ahead. And she said this. Our role remains to police impartially, being robust in tackling hate crime and extremism and ensuring protest is managed within the law. We have to police to the law as it is, not as others would wish it to be. And Chris Hope, I can see you waving your arm there. Well, the reason why they're saying that is because this last a week ago on the step of Downing Street, the PM said he mm. expects the police to take action. And I think people, people are watching these these, uh, these marches, these passing to the marches, notably last Saturday and now tomorrow. And that's why that police officer is saying that, because people are going to go, well, what's going to happen next? And it could mm. there could be flashpoints, because the, what is you saw when you saw the, the mm. projector putting those, those offensive words onto the Big Ben Tower, mm. and the police didn't step in for their own reasons, of course. Mm. But that's, that, that's where the kind of crisis starts, and why aren't the police policing these marches properly? May I jump in on this? The police don't... Yeah, just... Look... I'm a British person, right? I'm, I'm an England rugby fan. Tomorrow afternoon, <laughs> I will be at Twickenham, hoping desperately and shouting very loudly for an English victory. It's not going to happen against the Irish. I'm also someone whose grandparents were Jewish who came to this country as refugees. I don't want to see one example of anti-Semitism on mm. our streets. Every single act of anti-Semitism, and I've said this right from the beginning when these marches mm. started should be clamped down on and taken extremely seriously by the police. We have, as well, to protect our very, very hard-won right of protest mm. in this country and the right to freedom of speech. And I'll give you just one example of these marches. On the, on the 18th or 17th of February, that, that, whatever Saturday that was last mm. month, I think there were roughly 30,000 people on one of these demonstrations. The police made 12 arrests. Yeah, but that's because now, they're standing off well, and not the getting question. stuck in. That's the question. Now... If the police, if, and I say this, it's an important word, if they are not doing their job, then obviously I would call on them to do their job. But what I hope is, if in a particular moment they feel the best thing is not to get stuck in, for whatever reason, that's their operational decision, they are nonetheless getting the sort of footage required to go after these people, arrest them and have them prosecuted is, afterwards. Is that the case? Because I was at that march at Parliament Square a couple of Wednesdays mm. ago, and I was pointing out the projector to the police. I was pointing out men in full balaclavas to the police. I was pointing out men throwing eggs and throwing, throwing liquids at, you. at me. The police didn't have a single scintilla of interest in nicking anybody, and it left me with the, with the obvious conclusion that they're not policing with fear or favour. They're afraid of this lot, and they're policing with fear. I think, a little, I think it's really good that you go to these these marches, and I want to get involved in one of these myself, not to protest on them, because, by the way, I know that there are likely to be some anti-Semites on those marches. Now, I think, well, Israel, every week. I, well, I think Israel's response to uh, the horrors of October the 7th, I think they've got it wrong, doesn't mean I'll go on these marches, because I don't want to rub shoulders with anti-Semites. I'm not saying that's anything like the majority, but it's not my scene, right? It is good that you do go on these marches, but sometimes a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And it's very important not to extra extrapolate for one example and then tar the whole of the police mm. force. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And on, on any march, a minority of, of knuckleheads get the headlines. We all know that. But what the point I'm trying to make, Matthew, is when I directly say to the police officers myself, that's an offence, that's an offence, that's an offence, or you go and take action. They had no interest in taking action. And that only can make me believe, and I went, also was on the Sanitaf march, as you know, where the police did take a very different type of action. They steamed in with batons drawn, with helmets on. The conclusion to those watching was clear. 
two-tiered policing seems to be what's happening. All I can say to you is that wherever the police get it wrong, I will be amongst the first to say they shouldn't be getting it wrong. Which amongst us doesn't want the police to do their job? What we've got to be careful about is not to draw widespread conclusions mm. from individual examples. Where there is an example, if they've got it wrong, they need to get it right. OK, and Chris, finally, um, you were very critical of Lee Anderson when he said that the, the, the politicians should be telling the police mm. what to do. Political neutrality should be key. Well, I was sitting in this chair when he said it. You were. I, I was surprised that an MP would say that. MPs vote on these laws, the police apply them, and we have to try and have this, this line between those, those two. We can't really have... The, he said, the gov why can't the government take over the policing? Mm. Because we aren't, you know, we are, we are Britain. You know, it doesn't happen here. We have this uh, tradition of, of our law are then in, in, interpreted by the police and have, they have to have that, 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 that thin blue line between those two things. OK, but at the moment, it doesn't seem to be working. We seem, we seem to be... And that's the line that the PM was risk crossing last week when he said, I want to see more robust policing. He's got this new... Um, the, 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 the police are expected to enforce the law. They can't have people outside um, uh, private homes and the, and the protest laws. I think, it's a, I think the public are crying out for it, mm. but it's half the police. Final word to you, Matthew Sadland. Should the politicians be telling the police what to do or should they just leave them to do their jobs? I think when it comes to their operational independence, clearly mm. the police should be left to get on with it. But should Jewish people and indeed Muslim people, because anti-Semitism and Islamophobia have surged since October mm. the 7th, should all of these people, including me, be reassured by our authorities Absolutely. And any example of Islamophobic hate or anti-Semitic hate should be clamped down on. Great. So, Matthew Sadden, excellent. Chris Hope, excellent. Both of you, fantastic debate. Thank you very much. Now, you get lots more on that story on our website. And thanks to you, GBNews.com is the fastest-growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News. Now it's time for the latest Great British Giveaway and your chance to win 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five in cash and a whole host of seasonal treats. And here's how to get your claws on all of that. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Now, Theresa May will always be remembered as a Prime Minister who didn't get Brexit done, and now she's legging it as an MP. She's quitting before the next general election. Now, the big question is, was she our worst leader of all time, or was she just dealt a bad hand at the wrong time? Well, I'm back, about to read out some of, the, some of your more printable emails. <laughs> I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, haven't well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning a on a fence door. whilst oh, watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the just fence. Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade 
come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through, we've followed them, and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine, he's, he's, he's on his phone, um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, he's on the phone to the... the the sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red taped. But surely, sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6 p.m. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6 p.m. on GB News. Welcome back. 5.25 is the time. You're watching or listening to me, Martin Daubney, on GB News. Now, former Prime Minister Theresa May has announced she will not stand at the next general election, just as the Tories head for electoral meltdown. Well, will anybody miss her? Well, joining me now is the former UKIP leader, Henry Bolton. Henry, no doubt you're going to say, Theresa May, absolutely blooming lover, mate. Are you there? <laughs> what on earth makes you think that, Martin? <laughs> um, no, sorry to dis disappoint you. Look, I'm sure I've never met Theresa May. Uh, I'm sure she's a very likeable, pleasant lady. But when you uh, are put in a position of leading either the Home Office or government department uh, or the country, you've got to have character, you've got to have vision, you've got to have imagination, you've got to have courage and you've got to will have willpower. Um, and I'm afraid Theresa fails on all of those points. And, uh, you know, any legacy that we sort of look at in, in relation to, to Theresa May, we've got to... Uh, we, we can't look at that without thinking about her as Home Secretary as well. Although Tony Blair's administration and Gordon Brown and so on, and, and then uh, she was Home Secretary under David Cameron, they were responsible, but uh, particularly under Theresa, Theresa May's uh, sort of leadership of the Home Office, for decimating the police. Not just cutting 21,000 police officers, but taking an axe to the civilian employees, uh, palming out and, and, and subcontracting custody suites, prisoner escorts, selling off police stations, over 600 police stations, and she continued the process of closing down regional police training colleges. So we're, we're still paying the price for that now, in the quality of training of our police, in the ability for them to work efficiently and so on, not having the premises. But as, as, as Prime Minister, um, you know, uh, the Brexit debacle under Theresa May beggars belief uh, for me. She gave away so much of our advantage to the European Union uh, over the Northern Ireland situation. She is responsible for the ongoing sore that the Irish border is. Now, 
I have a background in borders, Martin, as I think you know. And what happened was that the European Commission said to Theresa May and Gavin Barwell, her chief of staff, when she was prime minister, look, you have decided to leave the European Union. The problem of the fact that we are going to have to put physical controls on the, the, the border between the, southern, the south and the north in Ireland is your responsibility. You have to find a solution. And she just rolled over and said, yeah, OK, I accept that. You know, we, we're leaving. It's our, us that's caused this problem. No. The, the, there is a raft, there's a raft of, administra of, of legislation, uh, primary legislation, secretary legislation, mandates for different agencies in the European Union that talk about and require external border controls on the European Union's borders. That is a matter for them. We can never, never, from outside the European Union, alter that fact. The only people that can do that is the European Union, the European Commission leading it. Um, okay, and she, so she tied us into something that was impossible to get out of. Disastrous. We're still paying the price for that as well. OK, Henry, just want to read out a couple of emails here to you, if I could. Um, Joe says there's a lot of bit of an echoing this. We've been out and about in Maidenhead today, Henry. Theresa May was a great MP for Maidenhead, but she was a shocking Prime Minister for Great Britain. And Peter adds this. Theresa May was the second female Prime Minister, but as far, but as, far as I'm concerned, that was her only achievement. So, Henry, to sum up, if we could, she was great at the local level, but do you think perhaps it was an overreach too far to put in charge of Blighty. Absolutely. It's often the case when you get a leader at the national level who is a compromised candidate for that position and doesn't have what it's need, what's needed at the strategic grasp at that level, even though they're good people, they're well-intentioned and they're great constituency AMPs. I can think of another one, Damien Green down in Ashford, uh, who's, <laughs> who's dragged the party to the left and is keeping it there, but he's <laughs> disastrously, but again, He's an effective constituency MP. OK, Henry Bolton, thanks for your company. Thanks for your opinions. I suspect you won't be being thanked for getting a Christmas card from Theresa May. Henry Bolton, <laughs> always a I pleasure to have you on the show. And, of course, there's loads more still to come between now and 6pm, including Sadiq Khan's war on motorists continues. The Mayor of London this time is introducing yet another charge for drivers. Stay tuned out. Have a, stay tuned. I have a local lad telling us the full details. Another tax on the poor beleaguered motorists. But first, it's time for your latest news Headlines with Sam Francis. Martin, thank you. 5.31, the headlines from the GB newsroom. A major independent investigation has found that it's likely more lives were lost than saved by a double agent who was embedded in the IRA during the Troubles. The individual, codenamed Steak Knife, was working covertly for the British Army inside the IRA's internal security unit. Operation Canova examined more than 100 murders and abductions linked to that unit and found strong evidence of very serious and wholly unjustifiable criminality. Met Police Firearms Officer Martin Blake has denied the murder of Chris Cabber after being publicly named today for the first time. The 24-year-old was shot once in the head through the windscreen of a car in South London in 2022. The officer, who was initially identified as NX121, has been released on bail and is due to face trial in October. Lord David Cameron says it's incredibly frustrating that Israel's not taking steps to allow more aid into Gaza. His comments come after the UK announced it will join the US to create a new port on the Strip. However, the Foreign Secretary says Ashdod port in Israel could be opened immediately so that aid can be delivered while the temporary pier is being constructed. And a painting of the former Prime Minister, Lord Balfour, has been damaged by a group of pro-Palestinian activists at Cambridge University. The historic artwork was sprayed with red paint before being slashed apart. The government's adviser on political violence and disruption described it as outrageous and senseless. The Palestine Action Group claims the piece symbolised the bloodshed of Palestinian people since the Balfour Declaration in 1917. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com forward slash alerts.
For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a last look at the markets this evening. The pound will buy you $1.2850 and €1.1744. The price of gold is currently £1,707.19. That's per ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed the day today at 7,659 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Sam. Now, in a few minutes, I'll be reading out a few more of your more printable emails on the big news stories of the day. Get into it the usual way, gbviews at gbnews.com. That's the email address. Look forward to hearing from you. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional male breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Rao, as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, you know, when ho hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. And I want to shame this hospital. This is... Whether necessary. The, the University yeah, Hospital do. Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read God, aloud reading. in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yeah. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. From 10am every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. This Sunday on Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle, I'll be delving into the WPATH files, explosive revelations leaked by whistleblowers that show how the world's top transgender medical experts put a whole generation at risk. I'll be speaking to a range of guests, including journalist Michael Schellenberger, best-selling author Helen Joyce, leading physician Dr. Kerry Mendoza, psychotherapist Stella O'Malley, and many more. Find out about one of the biggest medical scandals of the century in Free Speech Nation this Sunday at 7 p.m. on GB News.
Welcome back. 5.38. We're on the final furlong. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, in a few minutes, I'll have a great story about the latest charge by City Con, London Mayor ripping off motorists. But before that, I've got some emails on the topic of the day. And, of course, that is Theresa May stepping down at the next election. This is the corker from Richard. Richard says this, I never thought anyone could be as bad as Gordon Brown, who was truly, truly awful, but Theresa May was. She was worse. As Nigel Farage said, the worst Prime Minister. But she has now somehow been surpassed easily by the current occupier of number 10. Richard doesn't like anybody by the sounds of it, but fair play, you're getting stuck in there, my old son. Phil says this, she was pro-Remain and hopelessly out of her death. But apart from that, Phil's a big fan. Matthew says this. I noticed on social media today, Mrs May has had a video made of her highlights in charge. It's only a six-minute clip. That says it all, really. Well, Matthew, what would you like? A sort of two-hour megathon, two-hour mayathon. There'll be plenty more to go into there. And Glyn says this. May has blood on her hands. She was the one that stopped Stop and Search, probably because she thought it offended people carrying knives. It's a good point. So she, don't forget, a lot of people have been saying that also 20,000 coppers were axed by Therese May. And are we still paying the price for that to this day? Stop and Search, of course, was a very controversial part of policing at the time. It came with a lot of pressure to be removed because it offended certain communities. And we saw then a corresponding rise in crime. It's almost as if you remove bobbies from the beat and you stop searching for offensive weapons, you might see more violent crime. Who would have thought it? On the same topic, Rob says this. Theresa May, as Home Secretary, as I was just saying, cut the police by 20,000 officers and it has still not recovered. And Helen adds this. Theresa May stepping down. That's the best news of the day for me. She's another one who ruined the Tory party and indeed the country. She was forever bowing down to Brussels and let's be honest, when she inherited the role as Prime Minister by um, David Cameron, her heart was never really in it. She wanted to remain in the European Union, despite the fact 17.4 million people told her otherwise. Dave adds this. Don't forget, she almost lost that snap election she called in 2017 to Jeremy Corbyn, not just because of her position on Brexit, but also because of her dementia tax to take old people's lifetime savings away from them to pay for care and her disastrous backing of fox hunting. Who on earth thought that was a good idea? Linda adds this. I was quite young when Theresa May became Prime Minister and the work that she's done is a large reason why I'm so interested in politics. Future MPs could take a leaf out of her book because she acted with dignity and grit. And I've had, I've had literally 2,000 comments on our social media pages. Let's read a few of those out now. On the topic of, is she the worst Prime Minister ever. It says this, Alby says, that surely is Liz Truss's crown. Don't take that away from her like that Martin. Um, Callum says this, you know what? I honestly don't think she was the worst Prime Minister because the bar is set incredibly low. Now, let's move on. There's more bad news for motorists today. Drivers will have to pay a toll to use the Blackwall Tunnel in East London. The Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, of course, says this new charge should not come as a surprise for motorists, indicating car drivers could be charged up to four quid, it's actually more than that, per crossing to use the tunnel with lorries and vans costing considerably more. Now, let's have a listen from a commuter who regularly uses that tunnel. So starting from next year, Sadiq Khan is going to be charging for the Blackwall and New Silvertown Tunnel. By the time it's introduced, the price is going to be around £5.25 for one crossing, so over £10 for a return trip. I mean, that bridge has been free for 127 years. It said around 100,000 people use the Blackwall Tunnel per day. And let's just say half of them, so around 50,000 got a return crossing every single day. That would make the government £500,000 per day for something that was free for 127 years. 
Well, that was Harry Morgan venting his frustration on social media earlier. I'm delighted to say that Harry joins us now on the show. Harry, thank you so much for joining us. We're the People's Channel. When I saw you making that eloquent point about this unfair tax, I said, let's get this fella on the channel. And here you are. Explain, if you can, to the punters watching GB News now why this is so unfair. Another tax on motorists. And in particular, you make a very good point about how this can hammer working class people with white vans. Exactly. Yeah, you're looking at about three pounds for motorbike, which if you're looking at the Dartford crossing is free currently for them. Um, you're looking at four pounds for cars and eight pound fifty per with vans as well per crossing. Um, but if this is to go with inflation, you're looking at about five pounds twenty five per crossing for a car. Um, and I'm a small business owner currently as well. And uh, we use the Blackwall Tunnel several several times a week. And um, it's sort of bad enough having to pay you, Les, your congestion charge zone fees. Um, so with this new tax, it's, you're looking about £45 per day in charges. 45 quid a day just to get through that tunnel. If you're on ULEZ as well, if you've got a non-compliant vehicle, a lot of white vans, I know that all, because a lot of my mates are builders, decorators, tradesmen. They don't have compliant vans. 45 quid, Harry, just to get about before you put petrol in, before you insure your vehicle, before you even earn a pound note. And there's no way around that tunnel, is there? Because Well, there is, but you have to go blooming miles around, mate. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's getting to the point where if... Well, it's not a matter of if, it's a when. When this new charge gets introduced, this is something we're going to have to put on to our customers. And especially in a cost of living crisis, this is the, the last thing that we want to really be doing to our customers, you know. And, Harry, a lot of people watching this go, well, you know, it's just London. Why should I care about London? But don't you think, Harry, we've seen with Ulez a lot of these ideas, these bad ideas, these low-traffic neighbourhoods, 20-mile-hour zones, these ideas start in London and they spread nationwide. They do. And, um, I mean, you see people like the Blade Runners as well. They've obviously caused quite a bit of disruption with what they're doing. And, um, yeah, it's not just London. I think in Birmingham you've got the clean air zone as well. I think there's one down in Bristol. Um, but, yeah, it just feels like yet another tax on the driver. But, um, but yeah. And £45 a day. There'll be no option for tradesmen. They're not charities, are they, Harry? They'll have to pass that cost on to consumers. The net result is people having their jobs done, people having their stuff delivered to them, all of these prices get passed on to the consumer during a cost of living crisis. The net result is we all get net poorer. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you take even builders, white van drivers, uh, Uber drivers, say something like that, they're, um, it's, it's a massive charge for them per day. That could be sort of half of their day earnings, potentially, you know? And, um, yeah, it just feels like yet another tax and it's um, starting to stack up. Well, Harry Morgan, car security consultant, thank you so much for sending that video in to us with the People's Channel. And if anybody's watching out there and you're a bloke like Harry who's community-minded, something in your community has rattled your cage, got your goats, please send it in. We want to hear from you. We want to be your voice. We want to hold those in power to account. Harry Morgan, top man on the island. Thank you very much and have a great Cheers. weekend. Now about to bring you footage of those pro-Palestine protesters attacking a painting of a legendary British Prime Minister who died more than 90 years ago. Just how low will these people go? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it should be staying dry for most of us through the rest of the day, but there will still be a chilly breeze that should last through much of the weekend as well. But through the southwest, it'll start, we'll start to see some showery rain through this evening. That's as this weather front starts to arrive across parts of Devon and Cornwall. So some showery outbreaks of rain to come here. But further north, elsewhere across the country, it should stay dry through this evening and through much of the night. But there'll still be quite a keen easterly breeze and quite a lot of cloud around.
That cloud could be thick enough to bring some drizzly rain to parts of eastern Scotland, and but it will be a fairly mild start to the day away from the far northwest of Scotland, where there could be a touch of frost in any sheltered areas. There will be a chilly wind, though, through much of Saturday, especially if you're exposed to the east coast, where the breeze will be much stronger. That band of rain will push into parts of northern England, parts of Northern Ireland, and for much of Wales as well. There's likely to be some outbreaks of rain through the afternoon. Further south, though, across central areas, parts of southeast, it will turn a bit brighter into the afternoon, but there is a risk of some heavy downpours. But in any sunshine, it will feel fairly pleasant with highs of 12 or 13 degrees. Rain's much more likely on Sunday. There'll be some quite persistent and heavy bursts of rain to come, particularly for northern and eastern areas of the country, with some dry spells, but a risk of showers in the west. It does look like that rain will clear away to the east, though, for the start of next week to bring some drier weather again on Tuesday. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back, it's 5.50. Now, as I've been discussing throughout the show, as we went out today, a, a video has broken on social media, and it's this. It's a painting of a former Prime Minister, Lord Balfour, um, and it's been damaged. In fact, it's been desecrated, it's been destroyed by a group of pro-Palestinian activists today at Cambridge University. Look at them there, they're slashing it up. They're slashing this this. Um, painting beyond repair. It's spray painted first. It's sprayed with red paint before being slashed. Now, the government's advisor on political violence and disruption has been forced to speak out on this, describing it as outrageous and senseless. Now, the Palestine Action Group claims that this piece symbolised, in their words, the bloodshed of the Palestinian people since the Belfour Declaration in 1917. Now, just to explain what that is, the Prime Minister of Great Britain then, Lord Balfour, was a part of the Balfour Declaration, which recognised uh, officially in British law the creation of the Jewish homeland in 1917, effectively giving legal credence to a Jewish homeland. That was in 1917. It's now 2024. This is basically what Just Stop Oil did, except taking it to the next level. My point to you is this. Does that make you sympathise with the pro-Palestine mob or does it make you see them for what they are? A bunch of entitled, aggressive, cultural vandals who don't care a jot about British values. In fact, they want to trample on them. They want to trample on them from within, desecrate and destroy them for their own cause.
Now, we're going to move on quickly to this story. Meghan Markle has called for better representation of mothers in Hollywood. In a powerful statement, the Duchess of Sussex has joined forces with the group named Moms First and the Gina Davis Institute on gender in media for a new study about the representation of mothers in entertainment. And the Duchess said in a statement... This report about the portrayal of mothers in entertainment highlights the gaps that we need. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. Let's now speak to re show's reporter, Stephanie Techie. Steph, welcome to the show. Basically, Steph, she's saying there are too many white people in television. She's looking for racism once again. She is, Martin. I'm not surprised by this at all. You know, Megan considers herself a feminist. And I think this is the latest woke thing to tickle her fancy. I know Hollywood has many battles when it comes to women and equality, but mum's representation is not one that they've really thought of. The survey, if I'm honest, Martin, like I'm all for women's rights, it's just a bit ridiculous. They're, you know, they're saying it's not a fair representation of women in America. They're saying most of the women that were portrayed to be mums were attractive, some of them were not queer, some of them were underweight, some of them were not overweight, and it's just forcing Hollywood to tick boxes again. You know, shows should have the creativity they want to use the characters they want to express a storyline. And the reason why I'm not surprised about this, Martin, is because we know that Megan and Netflix, they've got loads of shows coming out in the future, so it clearly we're going to be seeing a lot of mums that will be featured in Megan's production, which kind of reflects where she's at in her own life as a mother of two. OK, well, Steph, it's a short, short blast to the end of the show, so thank you very much for joining us. Always a pleasure. I hope to see you again on breakfast. In fact, on that note, early birds, if you're up and about tomorrow, I'm on breakfast tomorrow from 6am with the legend. That is Anne Diamond. Never sleep on this channel. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, presenting to you all week. We've had a fantastic week. We've reported on the budget. We've held them to account. After this, it's Jubes & Co, 6 till 7. They have a great week. But first, let's get the main thing out of the way, the most important thing of the show, your weather with Annie Shuttleworth. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good afternoon. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it should be staying dry for most of us through the rest of the day, but there will still be a chilly breeze that should last through much of the weekend as well. But through the southwest, it'll start, we'll start to see some showery rain through this evening. That's as this weather front starts to arrive across parts of Devon and Cornwall. So some showery outbreaks of rain to come here. But further north, elsewhere across the country, it should stay dry through this evening and through much of the night. But there'll still be quite a keen easterly breeze and quite a lot of cloud around. That cloud could be thick enough to bring some drizzly rain to parts of eastern Scotland, and but it will be a fairly mild start to the day away from the far northwest of Scotland where there could be a touch of frost in any sheltered areas. There will be a chilly wind though through much of Saturday, especially if you're exposed to the east coast where the breeze will be much stronger. That band of rain will push into parts of northern England, parts of Northern Ireland and for much of Wales as well. There's likely to be some outbreaks of rain through the afternoon. Further south though, across central areas, parts of southeast. It will turn a bit brighter into the afternoon, but there is a risk of some heavy downpours. But in any sunshine, it will feel fairly pleasant with highs of 12 or 13 degrees. Rain's much more likely on Sunday. There'll be some quite persistent and heavy bursts of rain to come, particularly for northern and eastern areas of the country with some dry spells, but a risk of showers in the west. It does look like that rain will clear away to the east, though, for the start of next week to bring some drier weather again on Tuesday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner, just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text PRIZE.